70s confessional, where Miguel Myers ATX and myself, Anthony Jerome M., discuss one iconic horror movie for every year of the 1970s. Miguel loves the 70s, and I do not. On this journey through this unique decade, we'll find out, do you really think the 70s are that great, or are you normal? I can never not laugh at that. <laughs> it's such a dig. It's such a dig. <laughs> <laughs> This is the fifth episode of My 70s Confessional. We're here to showcase some of the finest horror movies that the 70s have to offer and see if we can't help Anthony get an appreciation for 70s horror movies specifically and the 70s in general. Before we get into it, Anthony, I wanted to check your pulse. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about the movie we just saw, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Um, (laughs) So last week for Torso, I said I might have seen a a corner and I might be turning it. Um, I feel differently no. <laughs> this week. <laughs> uh, we've seen multiple maniacs, and I thought that was going to be the end all be all. Like, fuck this shit. Like, no, I'm good. But I see this, and I'm like, I appreciate its impact more than the thing itself, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to sit with that for a second. Um, <laughs> that, that hurt me <laughs> that hurt you the most <laughs> yeah and uh, i feel like i'm failing you I'm, I'm failing the 70s wow okay well let's talk about it and see if through talking we can't get like a, a better appreciation for the movie i mean we'll see because honestly this movie has elements that can't be uh what's the word? replicated so yeah, And like I've seen so many other movies since I I can recognize that so many other movies have tried to replicate certain things that came from this movie and they didn't do a good enough job. So, yeah, no, we, we will. We will get into it. OK, so then what we're going to do right here is go back. Way back, back into time. The year, sure. <laughs> the year is 1974. The top 10 music singles of the year were uh, starting from number 10, One Hell of a Woman by Mac Davis, nine, Benny and the Jets by Elton John. You know that one, right? Don't I don't think so. Is that, okay. <laughs> is that a dick? <laughs> no, would, no. <laughs> why would I know the Elton John song? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. At number eight, we have The Streak by Ray Stevens. Um, number seven, The Sound of Philadelphia by MFSB. Who the fuck yeah. knows? <laughs> uh, number six, The Locomotion by Grand Funk Railroad. Okay. Uh, Dancing Machine, The Jackson 5. Number four, Come and Get Your Love by Redbone. Yes. That's a great one. Love's Theme by The Love Unlimited Orchestra. At number two, we have Seasons in the Sun by Terry Jacks. And number one, we have The Way We Were by Barbara Streisand. So, for top movies, uh, starting at number 10, Murder on the Orient Express. At number 9, The Longest Yard. The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams. Airport. The Godfather Part 2. Earthquake. At number 4, Young Frankenstein, which I absolutely (laughs) fucking love. Um, The Trial of Billy Jack at number 3. At number 2, Towering Inferno. And at number 1, we have Blazing Saddles great fucking film i can't believe he had young frankenstein and blazing saddles in the same year mel brooks that's kind of crazy yeah you know i don't know much about him really Mm -hmm. i know that he's a legend though yeah i mean comedy legend uh i mean he's still alive and he's been doing it since like 40s and 50s it's amazing and then coming in at number 15 was the texas chainsaw massacre interesting okay i didn't know that yeah so So The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is an example of a grindhouse movie. Are you familiar with grindhouse movies, Anthony? No, not in its actual, like what it actually is. I just know it from what Quentin Tarantino did, the grindhouse with Death Proof and Planet Terror. And how it was just kind of these two, what's the word? I don't know. Strong kind of movies just back to back. So I, I only have an idea of it's these movies that are like really impactful or just very in your face. And it's like yeah. back to back. Yeah. So what a Grindhouse movie is. Oh, first of all, let's, I want to talk about what Grindhouse theaters were. So a Grindhouse movie is what plays in Grindhouse theaters, right? Mm-hmm. 
So grindhouse theaters are historically defined as those which show various films that are generally of poor quality or which have low <laughs> artistic merit. Um, they're also shown in continuous succession and all for which are available at a low cost of admission. Yeah, that's why Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez had their two movies together because in a grindhouse theater, movies would play, play back to back. Mm. Uh, and you'd be, you'd get more than one movie for the price of your ticket, right? Okay. So Grindhouse theaters were often located in entertainment districts that may have also featured burlesque-style entertainment venues nearby. Ooh. As such, <laughs> <laughs> we've seen the term Grindhouse used erroneously to describe burlesque theaters and those where adult entertainment, such as stripping and dancing, took place, but they're, they're not the same thing. They did have... Um, barkers, kind of like carnival barkers that would stand outside barking out the details <laughs> regarding the films taking place inside in an attempt to encourage adults to stop in for the show. <laughs> Very cool. So there was an all-night theater aspect of it as well. So historically, the Grindhouse theaters were open all night, and the accessibility of all-night theater on a single admission is something that many patrons couldn't pass up. Thus, they would spend long periods of time at the theater, sometimes otherwise referenced by the name Sleaze House, more appropriately. <laughs> so what you would see a lot is um, unhoused individuals or people who just were down on a luck, uh, on their luck, I should say, would buy one ticket and they'd have a place to stay for the night. Right? Oh, they, wow. Yeah. So that's that's that was an aspect of the grindhouse as well. So. Television was in some in some capacity almost helpful to the grindhouse, where many theaters were closed as a result of the rise in home television programming through the seventies. A rise in exploitation programming in grindhouses would keep their doors open at least for a short while longer, and eventually the era of grindhouse theaters did end. So the grindhouse's film history takes us into the nineteen eighties, where a decline in the number of viewers interested in watching low budget and equally low value productions would threaten the scene with home television improving the home video and a rise in cable programming the grindhouse was quickly being phased out and rendered obsolete um, by the mid 90s grindhouses that were once a part of grindhouse film history and largely visible in los angeles along broadway and hollywood boulevard as well as in new york city within Times square were gone and actually alamo draft house which is a mm -hmm. huge theater chain that was started out locally in austin and then has gone since you know kind of <laughs> all over in the united states started off as a grindhouse theater because they were showing second run movies of these these grindhouse movies to start off and then they when they got more successful then they branched out to to new to new movies and stuff like that you know i'm a little bit glad you kind of mentioned the alamo because i forgot about it <laughs> i heard you weren't supposed to do that yeah so uh, <laughs> anthony's gonna be here all week <laughs> I'm going to be in the basement of the Alamo. If yeah. anybody wants to see me, I'll have my bike with me. It'll be a good time. So, um, Grindhouse film history, uh, as we know, it has come to kind of a screaming halt. A very, very small number of Grindhouse theaters exist today. Several full feature films which share the original title, Grindhouse, uh, as an homage to the ongoing programming <laughs> style of this era, were released. So, literally, what you're saying, uh, the movie with. Uh, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. So real quick, what is a what is a grindhouse movie now? So we know what a grindhouse theater was. So what is a grindhouse movie? And I got I got this from Slash Film. So naturally, it's a movie you would see at one of these places at a grindhouse theater. Grindhouse can be a bit of a nebulous category as films that fall under that umbrella also tend to overlap with other genres such as horror, action, martial arts, science fiction and many others. A good rule of thumb when identifying a grindhouse flick is to ask yourself three questions. Would this film be screened at midnight in a grungy, cheap theater? Also, mm -hmm. would this movie be unbearably awkward to watch with my parents in the room? <laughs> and finally, does this movie feature one or a combination of the three G's, gore, grime, and genitalia? If you answered yes to all, then it's probably a grindhouse film. Well, so. I just found out I love grindhouse films, so <laughs> I love all I love all those things. Exactly. So we're that. See, we're already moving <laughs> forward. Okay, Anthony didn't even know I, it. I, I didn't even know it. I don't think negative negative energy is not going to get us anywhere. We're all here, positive <laughs> vibes. We're vibing right now. We're talking. 
So hey, I'm just saying I, I see I see the vision. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So uh, one thing I just wanted to end with, uh, as we all know, Quentin Tarantino's love for Grindhouse. And so I wanted to shout out that he is kind of help. Uh, he is one of the major driving forces in which in why Grindhouse is still a very sought after genre to this day, because he's obviously he's a very famous director and he's been kind of championing this Grindhouse style and, you know, also looking back to the past and seeing what's been done and, and, and seeing what you can do with that. So, so uh, he has a list of uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino's top 10 Grindhouse movies. And I just wanted to list them off real quick. Are these real quick? I'm sorry. Are these movies he made or movies he likes? These are movies that he likes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So uh, coming in at number 10, The Last House. And if you've seen any of these, let me know because I, I would love to know what you've seen so far. Number 10, uh, The Last House on the Left. Yes. Yeah. Great movie. Well, I love that one. Yeah. Very problematic. It's but, sickening, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's impactful. I'll, I'll say it's a good movie. I'll take back the great. <laughs> Tag there. Uh, at number it was nine, a ride. yeah. At number nine, the girl from Starship Venus, which I've never even heard of. Mm-mm. Eight, the Mac, which is a black exploitation movie, which we talked about black exploitation earlier with uh, with Blackula. Mm-hmm. At number seven, Five Fingers of Death, uh, which is a kung kung exploitation or kung fu exploitation movie. Oh, is that the one with? Uh, okay, it might be the one with Pai Mei, who's a character in Kill Bill. Who's oh, like possibly. I've, I've never seen it, so possibly, yeah. I think I've seen clips from that movie, and it, I've okay. seen clips of Pai Mei from the seventies. Any, I love kung fu movies. We can do my kung fu confessional <laughs> later. Like, <laughs> you heard it here. He said it. He said it. This is legally binding. I season, love kung fu movies. Season three of. Uh, <laughs> uh, so at number six, we have Rolling Thunder, which I haven't seen, but uh, I have. I think uh, neighbor Tim has um, been suggesting it to me for a while. Uh, coming in at number five is Coffee, which is another black exploitation movie that's starring Pam Greer. Uh, okay. At number four, Halloween. So Halloween is a, considered a grindhouse movie. No way. Yeah, because it was shot on a very, uh, very short budget. It's horror. It was shot in a small time frame, and it was uh, independent. It was not shot to be uh, like have this wide release. It was shot to just get it in theaters and make the quick money. So yeah, Halloween is considered a grindhouse movie. You know, I kind of like, for for whatever reason, Halloween being called the grindhouse movie makes me really like the fact that Halloween 2 takes place on the same night. Because if you played those two movies back to back, it's kind of like, oh yeah, grindhouse style. We're watching all these different movies. I like that a lot. Okay, 70s, all right. Look at you. (laughs) Uh, At number three, we have Night of the Living Dead. Uh, the 19th si- oh okay i was like the 19th was that? yeah. that's my favorite movie yeah i love it one of my favorite movies and then number two dawn of the dead okay and then coming in at number one texas chainsaw massacre number one number one so with that let's get started talking about this movie all right so we're here to talk about the texas chainsaw massacre from 1974 I have a few details I want to go over. And when I say a few, I mean a few. We've all probably seen this movie already by now. I'm the weird one. That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> Normally, like, you know, season one, I'd ask people, how did this movie pass you by? Now, I understand 70s, not your thing. I completely mm-hmm. understand that. But you've seen Halloween, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, later on in the decade. What was the reason behind not seeing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Was it the same thing? I hate the seventies, or you know, did you not like what you were seeing? Because you've seen you, uh, if we could say here, because I know we've talked about it, but you've seen other movies within this franchise. Yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah, I have. you've seen other movies before you've seen the original. <laughs> which, yeah, which other I... movies have you seen in the franchise? So I. I have seen the remake, which I think was 2006 with Jessica Biel. Um, I saw the direct sequel, which came out this year, 2022. It's on Netflix. Um, There is another one with Jason Derulo that I don't remember what that was called. But that's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, 
I even started watching the second one, like the sequel to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, never having seen the first one. And I honestly can't explain oh. that. The- the balls on this guy to come on this fucking show and tell me that he's seen the Jason Derulo one for the OG. Okay, was there any particular? And honestly, I don't get why? it. Because this at this point, this seems personal. You were actively <laughs> avoiding the original. No, no, no. Okay, so like, there's a handful. There's a handful of movies: um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Firestarter, Carrie, Christine. Um, there is this group of movies that I feel like were always on the Turner Classic Movies channel or TNT. And so like they were just always on. And so like whenever I would turn it to one of those channels, either it's the beginning or it's the middle or it's the end. So like I feel like I saw this movie. I never saw it from beginning to end, but I saw all of it in its pieces. And of course, I know now having seen Carrie and Christine and absolutely loving those movies, these movies are actually better if you watch them from start to finish and not just piece by piece and think you saw it. <laughs> it's like, it's not really how it works. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you watch a movie, you understand what it's about <laughs> and you might like it. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's because I thought I saw it, despite the fact that I saw it in all of its pieces. And like, I knew who Leatherface was. I knew kids pick up like a creepy hitchhiker. I know hijinks and Sue. Yeah. You know, but there's a, a pl- there's a bunch of things that I forgot. Like, Carrie's actually kind of a nice person. Um, I didn't know about I didn't know about Franklin from Texas Chainsaw. Um, Christine, I knew about the evil car, but I didn't know about Arnie and how he probably fucks the car. So <laughs> when you watch these movies from beginning to end, you get the context. What a concept, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. the only reason I haven't seen it is because I thought I saw it. Okay. But you also said you haven't seen it, right? No, I I have seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> Oh fuck! <laughs> so this isn't the first, but but while watching this movie, I think I this is only the second time I've seen it. Okay, and I only remembered like kind of like you bits and pieces, and so it was almost like a brand new movie to me because there's okay. some parts of it, and we'll get to like the very beginning where I was like, "What the fuck is happening?" This is not how I remember it, mm-hmm. and so. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Like I've I've definitely seen this movie and I remember huge parts of it, but there was other parts that I didn't recall. So yeah, I it's essentially like walking watching a brand new movie with you, which mm-hmm. which which I, I thought was dope. So hell yeah, hell yeah. So okay, so I, before we started talking about the movie, I did want to ask you that because that that kind of blew my mind. But, <laughs> all right, so I apologize for interrupting you. Please, no, you're fine. Please go ahead. Honestly, just hearing it out loud, I now understand how absurd it's <laughs> how absurd it sounds. Oh, I saw the sequel, the first one. Nah, I get it. Like, that's I, why I just that's why we're in the confessional, baby. We're we're, we're feeling good. We're we're yeah. getting all this off of our stre- uh, all this stress off of ourselves, you know? Right, absolutely. And I wonder how many other horror fans have like like no, that movie's always on TV. I've I've seen every part of it, but just like out of sequence. So I get it. Like, do yeah. you? Like, do you really? All right. So, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's a 1974 classic OG slasher film. Now, this was produced and directed by Toby Hooper. This was from a story and screenplay by Toby Hooper and Kim Henkel. Um, Now, the only other movies that I personally know Toby Hooper from are Poltergeist and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And I also know that he directed Billy Joel's Dancing With Myself video. And I love the 80s. So, like, that's the only reason why I know that. I don't even okay. like directors like that. <laughs> I, I did not know that. I don't know the song either. Uh, oh, okay. Well, right, do, do we have to pause recording, pull up Spotify, we... <laughs> and pull up Dancing with Myself? No, we can let it slide. I mean, it came out during your time. You should have heard it by now. But... <laughs> I see we're being hurtful now. Okay. No, I mean, you hurt me. <laughs> no. Okay. So, Billy, Billy who? Bill, Billy Joel. <laughs> Billy Idol. Oh, my God. No, no, no. Billy Idol. My ah. fuck up. My fuck up. No, no, no. Oh, my God. I still haven't Listen. heard the song, but... but... <laughs> yeah, well, I fucked up because... Billy, I'm a disgrace. Yeah, I got you. I I'm a disgrace to humanity. I, I do. Uh, I do know Billy Joel as well. But yeah, 
Uh, I know him from obviously Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, Salem's Lot, the the TV miniseries, and then obviously Poltergeist, like you said, mm-hmm. but also The Fun House from 1981. I stumbled I've not upon seen that. It. Yeah, it's you know, four teenagers visit a local carnival. And it, it's basically like a, a haunted house slash slash movie. Well, not really haunted by killers, you know. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was fun. But yeah, you're you're right. Like a, after you know, he he had a lot of promise, but unfortunately, like he got. I mean, we listened to Pod Mortimer, and they talked about his uh, problems through, with Poltergeist with Steven Spielberg, and also like with talks about him being uh, an alcoholic or something like that. Mm-hmm, hard mm-hmm. to work with, and so. That kind of affected his career. So he didn't get a lot of chance to to make a lot of movies. And then, fortunately, he passed away really young, which sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you included that. Now, one of the most well-known things about this movie is it was initially marketed as a story that was based on true events. And, like, we all know now that's absolute horseshit. Like, (laughs) bullshit, horseshit, dog shit. It's like (laughs) this movie paved the way. Pig yeah, <laughs> pig shit. Uh, this movie paved the way for all the movies we see now and get annoyed by that say either based on a true story or inspired by true events. Because we know you took one thing and you ran with it. So we know now this movie was kind of based off Ed Gein. So the Texas Chainsaw Massacre killer was not someone who really existed. Um, the one thing I want to say about this movie is it did cost about $140,000 to make at the time. And, like, for the sake of not killing the vibe, we're just going to leave it at that. What? Because <laughs> I don't know where the money went, but you know what? That's none of my business. I wasn't alive then. So. <laughs> it takes money to make things look this shitty. <laughs> you know what? That's kind of that's kind of like Dolly Parton. You know, it takes a lot of money to look this cheap. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. I feel like. Me and Anthony are going to be fighting at the end of this show, <laughs> the end of this episode. It'll it'll be it'll be a battle of the minds, you know. It won't be a fight. It okay. will just <laughs> it'll be chess, not checkers. <laughs> so the cast of this movie: Marilyn Burns as Sally Hardesty, Alan Danziger as Jerry, who is Sally's boyfriend, Paul A. Parton as Franklin Hardesty, Sally Hardesty's brother. We have William Vale as Kirk. We have Terry McKinn as Pam. And they she Pam is in a relationship with Kirk. Uh, we have Edwin Neal as the hitchhiker. Jim Sidow as the cook, a.k.a. the father. Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface. Robin Corten as the window washer. And John Leroquette as the narrator. Yeah, that's right. Uh, John Leroquette, right? That was weird mm-hmm. to find out. I don't know who he is. That's that, that's that bullshit that you're. <laughs> I swear, I swear, I swear. Respectfully, okay. I, I don't. Where's he from? Um. So, have you seen <laughs> Night Court? The in no. the eighties uh, sitcom. No. No. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> I'm laughing right now, but I'm crying on the inside. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. he was on a lot of sitcoms in the eighties and nineties. John Larroquette famously accepted this role for one joint. Like that's that was his price, like a one joint, which in today's weed is three point five grams. In case anybody <laughs> wanted to know, <laughs> love the conversion, love the conversion. right. That goddamn inflation, it, exactly. Damn. But also, it was probably like it's seventy skunk weed, right? So like one of those is equal to like a quarter of an actual joint nowadays, or something like that. I heard it wasn't as good back then, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I did want to say that like. A lot of these people in this cast have passed passed away early. So Marilyn Burns, who played Sally, she passed away. When? Uh, she passed away in 2015 or 2014. No, but she was Sally Hardesty. Yeah, she passed away. So at the age of 65, she passed away, which is really young still. Um, and then, of course, Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface, he passed away in 2015. And he was you know, 68 years old. Uh, and then, of course, Toby Hooper passed away. He passed away in um, 2017. And oh wow! He was, you know, well, you know, 74 years old. So a lot of these people, like, it's just hard for me to believe because 
uh, Halloween came out four years later, and everybody's still alive there, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's alive and thriving. You know, Jamie Lee Curtis is thriving right now, and John mm-hmm. Carpenter is, is doing his thing as well, you know? Uh, and then, like, the, the little <laughs> kids, they're in the, the remake and all that. So, anyway. They're it housewives. Was, it's yeah. Anthony Michael Hall. He's fucking dead zone now. Well, in my, I see him as dead zone, if you've ever seen that movie and yeah, show. Yeah, dead zone. <laughs> so, I just wanted to mention that, you know, and say RIP to these guys, because, I mean, they, they did a, a, a beautiful job making this movie, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up. No, yeah, I will absolutely agree with you. Like, they went there to work, and they did their job. However, I don't think anybody was like looking out for their best interests. Absolutely, but, you not. know, yeah. Absolutely when you not. need, when you need a check, you need a check. Yeah. <laughs> we all get it. Yeah. So, we're gonna start with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how it opens. The film opens with what is probably one of the most iconic horror movie openings there is. This is one of those things that, even though I didn't see the movie, I understood this opening is a part of it. And this is one of the reasons why I always felt so okay not watching it was because this opening scene is absolutely iconic. Not only that, but it starts off with this disgustingly yellow font that I absolutely hate. So like we're on theme here with the ugly yellow. It's like, I know what I signed up for. I'm just a little upset. You brought it to me. You know, <laughs> Yes, I ordered this. I'm just upset. It's on my plate. <laughs> if that, I know that makes no sense, but that's where we're at. Through the narration, we find out that what we're about to see is an account of a tragedy that befell a group of five youths. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a, became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, the date is August 18th, 1973. And at this point in time, the film kind of just sits us in a dark room, and we really don't know what to expect, and we really don't know what's going on. But we hear sounds, and we know something is going on, there's some sort of movement going on, and all of a sudden we see a flash. It's clearly the flash from a camera, and as the camera flashes, we are made to witness these decomposing body parts and just bodies in general. As we view these decomposing body parts, a radio announcement kind of lets us know that there's a, there's a cemetery in rural Texas that has been vandalized. Several of the gravesites have been desecrated. A lot of the bodies have been dug up and rearranged into very bizarre positions, sculptures. Some people will call them sculptures, but these bodies have been desecrated to the point where they're unrecognizable. Now, before we continue, Miguel... Any thoughts on this opening? So w- w- when the flashes go off and then we hear that, Meek. yeah, Meek. <laughs> um, yeah, man, like you, you know, right off top that that you're in for a very, very weird ride. Like mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable two seconds into the movie, right? Mm-hmm. Because they use these discordant sounds. There's no music in the movie. Other than like you'll hear a, a song or two in the radio later on, mm-hmm. and they were able to license that. But other than that, there's no score other than I think at the end uh, with the credits. But like in the movie, it's all natural sounds and like animal sounds and like uh, it's just it just yeah it, it it puts you in the mood to be like uncomfortable and then doesn't let up the rest of the movie. yes yeah I absolutely agree with you on that. So what happens is <laughs> Sally Hardesty, once again, played by Marilyn Burns, and what the movie calls her wheelchair, her invalid brother, which is the word that we don't use anymore. <laughs> we don't. I mean, you can call me an invalid because that's how I see myself. But we don't call other we don't call other people invalids like we just don't do that anymore. Were they trying to be hurtful? Because you could have literally just said wheelchair bound. Well, it also goes to the lack of respect that Franklin gets throughout this whole fucking movie. Like Franklin got it the fucking worst out of everybody. I would, you know, I would think, you know, um, cause a lot of people had it like quick, quick mm-hmm. kills and he did not. And I can't wait to get to that point to talk to you about that. Yeah. And yeah, I have, I have opinions on that entire character as well. So like, I'm, yeah. I'm glad we can like explore that further. Okay. So 
the movie starts off with Sal. Like what we know is Sally Hardesty and her brother Franklin. What they're concerned about is that their grandfather's grave may have been vandalized, as in the radio announcement or radio broadcast that we heard earlier. Graves are being desecrated. Parts are being taken. So their grandfather is buried at that exact same cemetery where that's happening. So they're worried about what's going on. So they're traveling with their friends, uh, Jerry, which is Sally's boyfriend, Pam, and then Kirk, who is Pam's boyfriend, once again, Franklin. And basically how we start off after we see that opening crawl and that desecrated body, we see what we what is probably one of the mascots of the 1970s. And it's that big, ugly, green fuck wagon. Like, <laughs> when as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, I'm really in it, aren't I? Uh, I, I, I I'm surprised no one's smoking weed and fucking right now. So when I saw this and I saw the colors <laughs> and I saw, well, some of them, like uh, the lady in the red shirt with the back, with the backless shirt, she gets mm-hmm. later. She, her Pam. outfit was better though. Pam, yeah. Pam, mm-hmm. but like when i saw like these colors and these outfits and the cars <laughs> i was like fuck i don't think <laughs> anthony's gonna like this based on our, our conversations previous to this <laughs> and it looks like i was right yeah yeah and just just so everybody knows just real quick if you haven't seen it yet weirdo i don't know why <laughs> but sally is wearing not a sweater vest she's wearing a sweater tank and the out, the outline of the neck is white. The outline of the arms, the cutoff arms, are white. And she's wearing white bell bottoms. And it's just a very disappointing sight to behold. It's like, man, you, I mean, you didn't leave the house dressed up for anything. That's beside the point. So we see this disgusting van and it pulls off to the side of the road. And we see somebody walk out. It's like, okay, cool. What's going on? What are we looking at? And we see Kirk pull out these two planks. At the end of these two planks, these planks have a brick of wood somehow attached, I think maybe super glued or what have you. And so Kirk takes these planks, places them in the van, kind of making a ramp. We see Kirk go back into the van, and then he wheels out who we know now to be Franklin. And I kind of thought this was like a really cool scene because this is what, this wasn't something I was ever expecting from this movie to show somebody who was disabled because... This movie came out in 1974. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1973. So I really wasn't sure if this if, if this movie was trying to say anything about disabled people. Uh, I just thought like, oh, wow, they're, they're showing somebody who's in a wheelchair? Like, I've rarely seen that since or before right now. So I just really thought it was cool. I'll yeah, tell you why yeah. later. I don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. Like right off the top, like we're like, oh shit. So we have this character who's disabled and we don't see it very often in in the movies. Now, I mean, that's cool. Like just the inclusion part is cool, right? As far as how they're treated, mm-hmm. maybe not as cool and we can get to that. But but overall, having this disabled character was really cool. Um, but the other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, uh, I, we passed it and it was my fault. I missed it was that that body that they had the decomposed body that was kind mm-hmm. of built uh, up, up on a statue or whatever. Mm-hmm. I remember none of that. I remember the back. St- I don't remember the backstory about them going to this cemetery to find their mm-hmm. grandfather's graves, like none mm-hmm. of that. So when I started watching this, I, I just remembered they were just on a trip on some random trip, because if you think about it, why are why is this group of five or six people going on a trip, a road trip in mm-hmm. the middle of August in Texas, Texas, to w- with your friend, like to go to go see her grandfather's grave? Mm-hmm. That makes it makes no sense to me. Like, there's nobody. I'm unless it's my wife, right? Your wife, <laughs> your significant other, your loved one. Okay, you have to go there for support, right? But like, if my if, if my boy is like, hey, like my grandfather's grave was possibly dug up. Can you go with me into like <laughs> the backwoods of Texas to find it? No, I'm no. <laughs> like, send a postcard when you get there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, slugger, you got to take care of that on your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, text me, you know, uh, Facebook, messaging me, whatever, Facetime me. Like, it's not <laughs> happening, bro. 
I'm I'm here for moral support. <laughs> like, did did that did it seem weird to you? No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Because where are Sally and Franklin's parents? Uh, that's my thing. Like, if it honestly, all they needed to say was like, "Oh, well, no one's gonna check since Ma and Pa passed away." Okay, great. Now I know why you two are going there. But yeah. if if my if there's something going on with my grandparents, Ma, Pa, you go deal with that because I'm over here, like. <laughs> Yeah, I'm here for moral support. I love you as your son, but I'm I'm not going to go investigate nothing. And also, it's giving very much like the Night of the Living Dead, the vibe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. where they were going to to go visit their father. Right, they Mm -hmm. went themselves, and they explained that the mother was too sick to make the journey. Right, Mm -hmm. so Barbara and Johnny went out by themselves. They didn't bring (laughs) a whole gang of hippies with them. Of friends, like honestly, like even if I was a hippie in that age, like your weed has to be great. You better have acid and food. I'm not about to just go in the Texas heat. There's no AC in that car. Like imagine how it smelled. Imagine how it smelled. Like it, there's a there's scenes at the later part of this movie where like it's famously known for reeking and people were passing out. And we'll get to that. But I'm just talking about in that car how much it smelled. It just oh I'm sure. I'm sorry to derail us, but that <laughs> thought was just passing through my mind. Like, oh, this is why they're together? Oh, that makes no sense. If they were just randomly going on a road trip, that would make more sense. But I guess mm-hmm. I, I know that they had to tie the, the bodies together, and that's very gruesome and terrifying and all that sort of stuff. It's just, uh, it was a surprise to me that that was an element in the story that I didn't remember. So, No, and what's interesting is like this movie – What we're told is, like, an idyllic summer drive turns into tragedy or what have you. So, like, at first, I literally just thought they were on a drive. Because what are you going to do in the 70s? There's no cable. There's no internet. There's barely any fucking magazines. So, like, yeah, you would take a (laughs) drive. Not no magazines. No (laughs) magazines. This isn't the Flintstones. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking little stone tablets. Like, yeah. yeah. So... I like because of because of the original open because of the opening I was like yeah like they're just going on a drive but when I found out there was actually a reason for them going behind the drive I'm like well now the fact that there's all these people here that doesn't make sense like if it was just a normal drive or just like hey we're bored let's just fucking waste the gas that makes sense but like ah eh, yeah so that's that on that okay so Franklin gets wheeled out of the van and Kirk goes back into the van and brings him a tin can. We find out that this tin can is so Franklin can pee. Now, to me, one of the reasons why Franklin is one of the most interesting characters to me, I don't like him. I don't. But one of the reasons I think he's one of the most interesting characters is because I don't know if he was given the direction to act like a boy or an adult. And throughout this entire movie, I don't know if this boy, I don't know if this man is four or 24. And this this goes throughout like how he talks, uh, the inflections in his voice and like just how he, he reacts to certain things and how he doesn't react. And just, I was like, what what's happening here? Am I supposed to like him or am I not? Did you have any of that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. And I don't know if this is the right term. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. But it felt like he was develop- developmentally stunted. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he was very childish, and yeah, I mean, later on, like he's doing blowing raspberries at people, which is very weird. Yeah, it's just he's he's a weird character. I like that they didn't make him a. A lot of times in movies, you'll see a, a disabled character, and he's they're like pitiable, right? Like people are like, mm. oh, poor the poor Johnny, whatever <laughs> you know, and they're like pinching his cheeks and say oh hang in there slugger you're gonna be all right (laughs) come on champ you got it you got this you're you're the brave one you know Mm -hmm. they didn't do that here they 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 gave um him the opportunity to be an unlikable character which which i enjoyed and i appreciated uh you know this is still very early on in Mm -hmm. horror movies and so i don't know if a disabled person would feel the same way because they're like you know this is literally, right this is literally the first time we're seeing a, a disabled character maybe maybe the first time they could be nice and then, then mm-hmm, all later mm-hmm. on. 
so you know there, there's a lot of things going around with, with this character but it, it makes them a, a more like a richer character more mm-hmm. depth a lot of depth yeah Her, i feel like franklin is definitely the most built out character in the movie oh interesting okay because i um it's very interesting that you see it that way because as we proceed through the movie i feel like his disability just makes him seem like an even bigger burden like he's a burden to begin with and i think throughout the movie he's seen as an even bigger burden to the people around him so like i honestly that's the only reason why i think he's disabled is just to show like what a fucking drag he is what a fucking Mm. strain on everyone else he is i would say that he's not a burden necessarily it's just the people around them who are dumbasses that treat him the way they do make him a burden. He isn't like he's just he needs to he needs to pee like any human does, mm-hmm. and they have a system for it. But the dumb we're gonna get to it. The, the yeah, holding him does something that affects Franklin, and then that causes a burden onto the rest of the group. So it's not him that's making himself a burden. It's the, okay. the ones around him that are, are making him a burden. Interesting. Okay, so they're not understanding the depth of his disability and the fact that he does need different attention. And so, okay, listen, I won't go I won't go too further on that, but like, okay, that's very, that's, that is very interesting. I'll, I'll say one more thing, and please understand, like, I, I don't have anybody... In my family who's disabled, I don't have a lot of experience with disabled people, but there, there's a, a, a scene later on in the movie where Sally, yeah, where, where Sally like takes him along mm-hmm. where she should not have, should have left him where he was. Mm-hmm. He would have been safer and perhaps even lived, you know, survived. Like, yeah. If you just understand the, the the disability that he has, but, but you know, also maybe he wanted to go. And so I'm just like talking in circles here. Like, I just really want to get <laughs> talking about this movie. So we'll, we'll get there, but yeah, I really do like Franklin as a character. He himself is unlikable, but I like the character. I like that. Okay, cool. So we'll continue on. So, like I said, I don't know if this, I don't know if the person who plays Franklin was directed to act like mm. a child or an adult. Yeah. I don't and know. And, yeah (laughs) and like i said his voices leave me extra confused so i'm gonna need your help explaining this because as kirk pulls franklin out to go pee in the can kirk does the right thing and gives him some privacy goes hang out by the van waits for franklin to take his piss and this big rig a rinko truck whizzes by and i don't I don't know what we see here. Is 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 the truck going so fast that the force of the truck pushes Kirk and Franklin forward, causing them to lose their balance? What did what did we see here? I may be mistaken, but what I thought was happening was that who was holding him? Kirk? Nobody. Well, see, that's what I thought. I thought that Kirk was holding him, like holding the just the stair, the, the wheelchair. No? Okay. Well, that, that's what I thought happened was he was holding the wheelchair and then the, the truck ro- breezed by, drove by and hit him in the face with dust. And because he got hit in the face with dust, he, like, he went to cover his face and that's when he let go. That's what I thought happened. Uh, if that's not what happened, then I don't know what the fuck happened. Like he just got scared and maybe, maybe it was just a timing thing. The truck <laughs> came by and he... Uh, just let loose and you know what happened happened but yeah I I guess I don't know what happened there then yeah so what I remember seeing is Kirk was just standing by the van looking at the road and this big rig passes by and what happens is the big rig uh, throws a bunch of like dirt and rocks into Kirk's face and this causes him to react strongly which that's totally understandable However, I don't know what happened with this big rig that made Franklin fucking totally freak out and his chair got pushed out of the way. He threw his can of piss and rolls down a hill. And I'm going to tell you right now, that was not acting. Uh, that person actually fell down that hill because we see later in the movie, uh, the, pers- the person who plays Franklin has cuts on his arms and his forehead, and those are real. This is another situation where I don't understand where if Franklin was directed to act like a child or an adult, because as Franklin rolls down the hill, Kirk comes to see like, Hey, are you okay? 
And Franklin has kind of like this babyish cries, like, ah, 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 like, hey, you're 23. He's 23 years old in this movie. He should not be communicating like that. Yeah, but he also ate shit. Like, he fucking tumbled. <laughs> like, he could have been, he could have had a concussion. Like, you were right. Like, he, this looks like this character, like, really did it and, like, just tumbled this. And yeah, you could see, like, scrapes and abrasions that are, mm-hmm. they, didn't, they didn't have the makeup to do that. So he definitely did his own stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. he And like one thing that told it for me in particular was that he had a bruise in the corner of his head and like, they didn't have makeup artists like that. Just doing little final details. That was an actual bruise. Like yeah. <laughs> this guy got hurt. Which is just part of the grindhouse thing. Like you don't have the mm-hmm. budget, stunt, man. You just got to do your own stunts. And also nobody knew who these actors and actresses were. So legitimately they were abused. Yeah, like we hear about like um who was it? Was it Psycho? No, it was um on Birds. The Birds. Yes. When mm-hmm. Alfred Hitchcock was um messing with Tippi Hendren. Like mm-hmm. Carolyn Burns, who plays Sally, went through some fucking shit and we'll get to mm-hmm. it. But yeah, and everybody in general, the whole cast, like they were sickened. They got sick making this movie so, you know, we'll get to it but yeah they i absolutely. agree they, they were abused absolutely but uh so one, one more thing i was gonna say is i don't blame toby hooper because he went through the same shit with them it's not like he wasn't in the room smelling all the fumes and getting sick as well he did this as shit too like yes he uh, there's blame on him but he was also making it, it was there was no power structure it's not like Alfred Hitchcock, who was a world famous director at the time when he was still making the birds, that everybody was a nobody, you know. Everybody mm-hmm. was just excited to be making movies. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Right, absolutely. So after Kirk helps Franklin from his like tumble down 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 the hill, we're back in the van. Pam, Kirk's girlfriend, starts reading from a book called A to Z Horoscope Maker and Delineator. She tells him what happens when planets go into retrograde, which now in 2022, we kind of understand that like if something's in retrograde, that means some awful shit's about to happen. Or like online, when bad things have happened to people, they'd be like, oh, well, I guess Mercury's in retrograde. Miguel, (laughs) any input? I'm trying not to have my eyes roll in the back of my head. Um, I am the skeptic here. <laughs> I don't believe in in any of. If you believe in it, I'm happy for you. Um, I'm not going to take anything away from that. Uh, I personally don't believe in any of that. Same thing with. I mean, it, does this have to do with Scorpios or with with your signs, like your Scorpio? Or it does. Virgo? Yes, astrology. Astrology. Okay. Yeah, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, but. I have nothing to add to this that would that wouldn't like have half have everybody angry at me. So I'll just say <laughs> I don't believe in any of this stuff. Right. Yeah, and a lot of people don't. And it's just it's just really funny. It's something that she says a little bit later uh stands out, but we'll get to that when we get to it. But but in in the for terms of this movie, it's funny like you said, if mm-hmm. Mercury or was it Mercury in retrograde or whatever? Uh, Saturn at this Saturn. point in time. Okay, <laughs> so if it was Saturn in retrograde and and you're saying that that means some shit's gonna happen, that's really cool, right? Because that's exactly kinda, uh, maybe in the seventies more people knew about that stuff uh, and mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. more in your face, but like seeing it now, like I don't know anything about that, so it's kind of like um, a low key foreshadowing, which I really, really exactly like. no exactly, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Well, we'll talk about it now. How later on Pam says, oh, Saturn's in retrograde. And she literally says, hey, if you piss people off, it's not going to go over well for you. If you're traveling a long distance and to unexpected places, it's probably not going to be the best for you. And so, like, we see later that Franklin is really worried about Saturn being in retrograde. And, like, based on that, I have determined he's probably a Capricorn. Because, like, Saturn is the ruling planet of people who are Capricorns. So... Honestly, and shit went the way it did for him. So he probably is a Capricorn. Either way, I digress. So we finally get ourselves to the location where Sally and Franklin's grandfather is buried. Now, I can't tell if this was an outdoor bar or a cemetery. As soon as, <laughs> as, soon as Sally shows up, 
immediately some man just grabs her by the arm. It's like, oh, you know, you want to find out where your granddaddy is? Let's let's go find out. And I was like, too aggressive. I don't know you. I don't like you. There's men drinking all over the place. I don't feel safe. Like, what is happening here? First of all, he that guy who grabbed <laughs> her arm, he's like, he says to... I don't remember who her boyfriend is, but she said, he says, I'm going to take your girl if you're not careful. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. This is that backwoods, Texas country, redneck hick shit that I don't fuck with at all. Mm-hmm. I don't fuck with it. I live in Texas and I very rarely go out of Austin. Like I stay <laughs> in the big cities because fuck all that shit. Right. And also why are you drinking at a cemetery? Like what's, who are you? Who are you trash? Not even, not even. Why are you drinking in the hot summer Texas heat? Right. That makes no sense to me. Outside. (laughs) Outside. Sitting in a, uh, in an abandoned tire. Yeah. (laughs) That old dude was just, he was gone. He was, he's fucking bubbling up. He was foaming at the mouth. He's not well. He was drinking shine, right? He was drinking moonshine, right? That's, uh, that's something. That moonshine shit. Yeah. No, uh, right away, absolutely no. This all this this scene, no, just no. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh damn, so I'm creeped out. Good job, movie. Like <laughs> yeah. you fucking freaked me out. So we cut to Franklin in the van after they uh, after Sally's been whisked away. Franklin's in the van, and that's when we're treated to Franklin viewing either some kind of prophecy or warning or simply the ramblings of a clearly drunk man who's drinking on a hot Texas afternoon. Uh, You know, he said, things happen here about things they don't talk about. You think I'm just an old man, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? I regret ever laying eyes upon you because now I'm fearing for my life. And so luckily they discover that the grave is intact and they get to leave and they're gone. And as they're driving away from the cemetery, we see that they're all of a sudden blindsided by this absolutely terrible smell. And Franklin's weird ass, absolutely drenched in sweat, recognizes that they're approaching a slaughterhouse. And like, as he tells his sister, Sally, like, ain't that the slaughterhouse grandpa used to sell his cattle at? Like, Franklin, shut the fuck up. Who cares? Nobody wants. So what, Franklin? So what? So have you ever been driving like on a road trip and come across one of these like rending plants? Never. Oh my God. <laughs> so in Illinois, when I, when I would live in Chicago, we would drive up to Wisconsin to see Hillary's parents. And along the way, there'd be one or two of these rendering. I think it's called a rendering plant, you know, where they would render the meat. Right. And the smell was, you could like, you know how, like when you drive past a, like a skunk, right it's mm-hmm. like that bad but for longer like mm. it's for a, a county's length worth and the Ugh. same thing in texas like uh, we, we'll drive somewhere of course outside of the city but it's it's only like going from one major city to another major city like, <laughs> this it's terrible and you, you yeah man it's it's just a stench it's unbearable and i can't imagine working at a plant like that like you have to get physically sick to be around that all day you know or desensitized which is even worse in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're blindsided by the smell of the slaughterhouse that they're approaching. <laughs> I just told you I was about to eat. <laughs> hey, you're eating. Delicious you, know, <laughs> you know what we're watching. This is your, is that head cheese? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was terrible. So, so Franklin enthusiastically describes how the cattle used to be killed with a sledgehammer. You used, to, you used to take more than one lick sometimes. Franklin, shut up again. And he tells them now that they use an air gun. This kind of disgusts everybody in the entire group. And shortly afterwards, Sally notices a hitchhiker who's played by Edwin Neal. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever driven past a prison, there will be signs that say, don't pick up hitchhikers. Yep. I think that sign should have existed around slaughterhouses as well. <laughs> good. That's a good point. That's a good point. Like don't pick up hitchhikers. So don't pick up, I don't get... pick up hitchhikers at all. Like in general, that too, that that's too. That, and it's, that's that seventies bullshit. Man. That's exactly that. Thank you for taking the words right out of my mouth because that is that seventies bullshit. 
and nobody but Sally wants him in there. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like the way they brought it up. It was like, hey, there's a hitchhiker. Let's get let, let's pick him up. You know, it's like mm-hmm. that was the the default was first pick them up and then you check to see what they look like. Not mm-hmm. not picking them up being the absolute last thing we would ever do. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's like mm, no. I, I read something. Who knows if it's true or not? But uh, one of a, the state troopers went up to uh, the hitchhiker, and uh, did you read that and said, you know, thank you for like making the movie because it dropped incidents of people being, you know, violence towards hitchhikers by like eighteen percent or something. It yeah, it dropped crime eighteen percent. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I do want to give this uh, movie some nostalgia points, though, because in my opinion, this is clearly the origin of the creepy, creepy hitchhiker. This is uh, this is the blueprint, rather. Yeah. Uh, they see they see a hitchhiker and they find out that they should not have picked them up. Mm-hmm. So this guy is <laughs> this guy is such bad news. I'm pretty sure I saw him have a red flag inside that little coin purse he was holding. <laughs> like this. <laughs> This man had this man was adorned in red flags, and he looks like he fucking smells. And I like this wasn't smell a vision, but I knew he smelled bad. I knew it. I knew it. To be fair, they all look like they smell, but but this guy in particular. Yeah. <laughs> but if I say the '70s smell, all of a sudden I'm the bad guy. Okay, see, specifically in this movie, <laughs> Grindhouse. Sure. This is the Grindhouse shit. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. You you so. said that you said that you don't like it's not that you particularly like beautiful things, but I think what we're learning more and more <laughs> is that Anthony does like the beautiful people, the beautiful people, right? You know what? This <laughs> because sure. you were loving last last week torso, <laughs> the fucking style, the culture, the women. I did this come one, here to be dragged, okay? <laughs> I could I could take a piss on this. Like <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here to be dragged. Okay. Thought we was boys. Right. I, just, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> so in the van, Franklin asks him if he works at the slaughterhouse, and the hitchhiker gives a big red flag of an answer. No. But I was there though. <laughs> I'm not, I don't I'm think they give tours. Out. I don't think they give tours. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, what What are you doing there? And this is when the hitchhiker creepily says, my family's always been in meat. <sighs> I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't like you. Now, for whatever reason, Franklin wants to know if the hitchhiker has ever been in one of the kill rooms. You know, the ones where they got that air gun that killed the animals. Now, for whatever reason, this also displeases the hitchhiker who says, no, 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 no. The sledge, the sledge is better. The animals die better that way. And also, one of the most interesting points of the movie is that the hitchhiker says that the air gun has put people out of jobs. And I personally believe that had maybe this point been expended upon a lot more, this movie could have been a lot more interesting, could have had a lot more. It could have had a lot more heft to it. It could have mm-hmm. meant something as opposed to just uh, what I kind of interpret as just like a mindless killing spree. Yeah, This movie could have had a lot more weight to it, in my opinion. That's true. I hadn't even thought about that, but there's that socioeconomic impact that Mm -hmm. people who were unemployed due to this technological advancement in in their Mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And so they had to revert to, as we'll see later on, and and I'm sure is no surprise to anybody who hasn't seen the movie, but they revert to cannibalism. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it would be interesting to find out. And and, uh, I'm not talking about like... parts two or three or beyond because for the for the point of this a- episode we're just talking about part one right i don't know what mm-hmm. happens later maybe they do mm-hmm. expand on it but for now if they had expanded on that and shown why they had re- came to this mm-hmm. that, uh, that obviously would have added a lot of depth to the movie now mm-hmm. we also have to think about budgetary restraints and all that but that's a great <laughs> a, a great point that you made i hadn't really even thought of that I just kind of just took it from the perspective as like, shit has to be really bad before I start eating people. Like, I'm not just about to resort to eating people because I lost my job. And this movie could have very easily explained like, hey, this is a very rural town. People have no education. They only knew this one thing. This is why they are the way they are. Now, this movie could have done a lot more. And in my 
perspective. Like it, the the bones were there, yeah, but not much more. The bones were there, really. Is that <laughs> um, but that uh, that's also assuming that they didn't start eating humans until after they were unemployed. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe they were eating it before. You know. Right. You know what? Yeah. Because why do you just turn to cannibalism? <laughs> like, oh, right. Checks not coming in. Let's eat people. Right. This might have been a lifelong practice. Yeah. Because how old is, is grandpa later on? He looks decrepit. <sighs> 250. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and grandpa, as they talked about later, he's been doing it forever. He's the best that ever mm-hmm. did it. Best there ever was. Best that ever will be. That I still am the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't really know what they were when they started it, but it's a great point that you brought up. Cool. So, Franklin then asks, like, hey, were you the one who was doing the killings? And the hitchhiker wants to have a different conversation and pulls out these pictures from his little coin purse. And we then find out that he actually was one of the people who was responsible for slaughtering the cows. And if he didn't slaughter the cows, he took pictures of it. And Franklin seems a little bit uninterested at this point. So he grabs Franklin grabs his own pocket knife and just starts cleaning his fingernails with his pocket knife. Some now this just entices the hitchhiker and the hitchhiker's like, I want me some of that and just snatches it out of his hand. And so the hitchhiker, yeah, the hitchhiker grabs Franklin's pocket knife and cuts his own hand laughing, giggling, moving back and forth. And Everybody in the car is like freaked out by this. Yes, they freak out, not to the extent that is necessary. <laughs> like that's one strike, one strike and you're out. So, so two things. One, Franklin's being a complete idiot because think of it from the hitchhiker's perspective. Maybe the hitchhiker was just weird, but didn't have any malice, right? We we know that he does eventually, but mm-hmm. let's, for the intensive purposes. Let's think that that hitchhiker doesn't have it. All of a sudden, somebody who picked you up pulls out a knife, right? Like, what the fuck are you doing? Why would you do that? And then Mm -hmm. it's like, wow. (laughs) The conversations we have here, what what, what happens? It's like when you call police to a mental health situation where somebody's having a mental health breakdown and you bring police into it, you are introducing a gun into the situation which is mm. not necessary, right? Yeah, so okay. You're amplifying the danger in the situation just by your presence. So that's why you sh- you know, police should not be responding to nonviolent um, mental health situations. You should have <laughs> mental health professionals going because you don't want to introduce violence into the situation, which is the only thing that police officers do. Right. So it's a cab all day. I just want to say that. So that's exactly what Franklin does. He introduces this violence, this knife, Mm -hmm. this weapon into the situation. Who knows? Maybe he, uh, the the hitchhiker had nothing. Was it was just going to be weird and wanted to ride like, but then when he sees the knife, shit goes bad. Who knows? We, we don't know. And Franklin was an idiot for bringing it out. I just want to say that. I totally agree with you on that. And we see it a little bit later where um, the hitchhiker has a very intense reaction to something that we all seem would probably deem as tame. Like, no, I don't want to buy your picture. And like the hitchhiker, it does not like that. So I can totally see how Franklin uh, indirectly is heightening emotions. Like, honestly, I don't know you. I don't know any of you. You're all looking at me and you pull out a knife and you're acting not interested. Uh, What are you going to do with that knife? Right. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that. Now, like I said, everybody in the car was freaking out, and the hitchhiker notices this and just calmly returns the knife to Franklin. <laughs> he invites the entire group over to his house after, like, describing how his brother makes the best head cheese. And, like, reluctantly, everybody declines the invitation, and they're like, uh, you know what, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of in a hurry. We can't really, <laughs> We can't really be doing all that. And so you don't want to describe the process of making head cheese. I don't give a fuck. (laughs) (laughs) I was hoping I I didn't want to do it either, but suffice (laughs) it to say, it's nasty, nasty meat that you don't want to eat. Like I don't want to eat. And I've never had it. So yeah, but Mexicans eat that type of shit too. Like brains (laughs) and tongue. I don't fuck with any of that shit. Very true. Um, But 
um, Head Cheese was one of the working titles, original titles of this movie, which I thought I was did really hear cool. that. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that and I was like, well, I'm glad I only learned that now because I would have hated to have that fact in my head for longer than 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody reluctantly declines the invitation to dinner because like, you're a fucking weirdo, bitch. Hands down, you're a fucking weirdo. And so the hitchhiker takes his camera off his neck and he looks as if he's about to take a picture of the entire group. However, he zeroes in on Franklin and takes a picture. He shows Franklin the picture (laughs) and Franklin with his rude ass, with his four year old slash 24 year old ass. Well, it doesn't really, it doesn't really look too good now, does it? And the hitchhiker does not like what he just heard. He's like, Hey, it's a really good picture. Pay me $2. And I'm telling you right now, $2 in 1973, that's $15 today. Right. Most people don't make $15 an hour. I'm not paying $15 for a picture. A Maybe jank- for a burger. Yeah, sure, yeah. For a burger. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We talked about the burgers and multiple maniacs. You know, maybe I'll buy one of those. I'm not buying a picture for that price. I just simply won't do it. <laughs> I simply can't. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I wanted to say that, man, I just think Franklin just dealing with this all wrong. And it's... Like, first of all, after the dude cut himself, you're gone. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. You're out. Mm-hmm. So th- the fact that he's still in the car, automatically everybody in there deserve, doesn't deserve what they get. But at the same time, like, be smarter, right? Right. And then uh, and then for Franklin to just be antagonizing this mm-hmm. unstable dude, like, what do you think of somebody who cuts himself with somebody else's knife? They're obviously unstable right so why would you antagonize mm-hmm. this person i'm getting angry i'm getting upset no <laughs> hey but miguel yeah. has has anybody ever like taken your knife and because <laughs> this sounds really this i used to really I used to be a knife dude i used to always walk around with a knife just like uh how jp from pod mortem says that yes <laughs> i used to be that dude and we would be hanging out with friends and i whip out my knife and like i'd have an apple and just cut the apple up and eat it or whatever this I'd, fucking guy I'd find oh whatever my God. reason to bust out a knife and then um one day i got uh busted by the cops for something else and i also had this knife and it was uh, in illinois i don't know how it is in texas it's probably in texas you could probably have a machete i don't know but in texas <laughs> uh, i mean illinois generally the wo- the rule was that the blade couldn't be longer than your palm right like your palm this way right? okay you could have any knife with you less than that right and this was not that and so uh, you had a bowie knife on you yeah that's the point that's the point right yeah <laughs> so uh, uh luckily like the, the cop got me for everything else but didn't get me for that it could have that could have been a lot worse so since then i stopped carrying a knife and like i've kind of come around on that sort of shit but <laughs> but yeah i was like yeah you need to be better with somebody who has a knife right so that's all it's just fucking frankly right. <laughs> That's funny. I have a, it's not a, it's not an actual butterfly knife, but it's a butterfly knife that you practice with. And so like sometimes when I'm walking alone, I will have that in my hand, just like. (laughs) (laughs) So in case you're like a gang tough or something. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of street tough. So like (laughs) if anybody wanted to start shit, just like, it's like, so they think I have a knife, (laughs) but I'm over here just. And snap at no, the same time? Like, no, I don't whistle at night. That's a whole other thing. But <laughs> wait, what? You've, been, you've been in a situation in which, like, you know what? I really wish I could whistle. I really wish I could whistle, but it's nighttime. I don't want to draw undue attention towards me. I just, I heard one time that whistling at night uh, attracts demons and bad spirits. So, like, ever since I heard that, I'm like, okay, I don't need to whistle. <laughs> Is it at night outside that the yes. demons are attracted? Outside. Okay. Okay. All right. So in your house, <laughs> like you would, re- you could whistle right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. So it's the, the the presence of a door or a window that enclosed. Like if I, if, so is it that the demons are you whistled and they're outside but they can't get in? Or well, because there's no demon. There's no demons in my home. So are you, are you I can sure about that. Yes, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> trust. 
I have proof. Okay. But <laughs> I don't know what's going on outside. Yeah. Right. But so my question was, if they, if you whistle at night and you're inside, are the demons outside the window trying to get in or do they not appear because you weren't outside? It's kind of like I sprayed raid all over the place. So they don't even want to know what's going on over here. Got you. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's been Demon Protection Corner from <laughs> My 70s Confessional. Yes. And let's get back into it. <laughs> So the hitchhiker takes uh, takes a picture of Franklin. And I kind of really like this because I didn't know Polaroids existed at that point in time. So to see him take a Polaroid, I was like, that's kind of interesting. Franklin doesn't like the picture. The hitchhiker demands his $2 payment. Franklin refuses. And the man, the man does something that I really wasn't expecting in this movie. He pulls out a piece of, uh, two pieces of like foil paper from his coin purse, unfolds it, puts the uh, picture in the middle of the foil paper and i think he puts like gunpowder or um, maybe magnesium phosphorus i'm not entirely sure and sets it on fire and he sets the picture on fire in the van and nobody's with it he immediately gets kicked out like he should have been kicked out but like <laughs> finally they're taking a stand and so as he gets kicked out he kicks the van. He's sticking his tongue out. This man has like the worst case of swamp ass that I've ever seen. Honestly, we could even call it Everglades ass because this shit is fucking damp. And that, <laughs> I don't I know if anybody looked there. I did not look. Oh, I saw the wetness and I was like, God damn. Uh, like, <laughs> but I wanted to back up a little bit. Did, did we mm-hmm. talk about the, the hitchhiker slashing? um slashing franklin no we didn't yeah so so in the in the pro- after he does that where he he becomes a magician for a second right and, you know, <laughs> and everybody's not with his shit like they, they try to kick him out but he grabs franklin's arm and he pulls out or he pulls out the um switchblade first and then grabs franklin's arm and just digs deep into that shit. and i know an artery was sliced like or something right like, there's no way that Franklin's still alive after that, after all the blood that he would have lost. But this shit is gnarly. Yeah. Every time it You think happened, so? You didn't think it looked, it looked bad? It looked very surface level. Okay. Do have you ever, do you ever like shave yourself? Do you give yourself a straight razor? Yeah. Okay. I used, yeah. I used to own one. I thought I was a classic man for the longest time. And I was like, this is how men shave. And yeah. I even had that little leather belt where you sharpen it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had all that. <laughs> See, so I have a straight razor. That that's how I shave. The lining of the beard and everything. And if if I do like one little nick, like that shit is so razor sharp, like literally razor sharp. <laughs> it cuts so fucking deep. Uh, it, oh, man. When, when you get that first initial cut, like you could see the white, the white meat. Dude, like <laughs> I... Th- I honestly think the, the 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 amount of pressure that the old boy put on Franklin, it it went to the bone. That's how. So like to me, it's like one of the most cringiest moments I've ever seen. It's just like, ugh. But you know what? He he does seem like the type to to cut somebody with a dull blade. Ooh, ooh, that's a good point. I hadn't even. I hadn't he even seems like that kind of fucked up. Yeah, like a dull, rusty one too. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that cool. he cut animals with. That he cut his fucking uh, slaughtered cows with. Like, there's nothing about this guy that says clean, precise measurements. Like, like yeah. he's not, you know. And we even see him use it later in the movie at the very end. And so, mm-hmm. okay, okay. yeah, just that part of it. Like, be you know, watching all these horror movies, you get desensitized. But this is that's one of the things that I always like connect with, where I'm like, ugh. You know, <laughs> I I definitely did enjoy a little bit more than I should have when he pulled the straight razor out of his sock. He's like, I got this, too. I yeah. was like, damn. All right. Like, hey, cool. I, I yeah. So <laughs> that's where I where I fall on that. So now they kick the hitchhiker out and they realize they're running low on fuel, this entire group. And they stop. Okay, this is something that I wanted to bring up. They stop at this rural uh, rural gas station slash barbecue joint, which Miguel, you've been to. I've seen the pictures. Yeah. Did they have barbecue? Did they have gas? Because tell us a little bit about that. Okay, thank you very much for bringing this up because I <laughs> I do want to talk about it. So this gas station that they stop at is is um, now called, I think it was a Texaco in the movie. Mm-hmm. 
And then very recently, within the last, within a decade at least, um, somebody bought it and restored it, and now it's just called the gas station, and it's located in Bastrop, Texas, about about forty five minutes northeast of Austin, and um, it's the original gas station filmed in the movie. Out front, they have a bench dedicated to Toby Hooper, Marilyn, and, and Gunner, mm-hmm. um, and you can't sit on it; it's just decorative, but it looks beautiful. <laughs> And then they have a replica of the green 1972 Ford Club Wagon out front Ugh. that you can that you can take pictures with, uh, which which I did. And then uh, inside <laughs> they have a full store filled to the uh, to the brim with all types of horror memorabilia from all your favorite movies. They have shirts, they have Blu-rays, they have pins, they have posters, they have masks, you name it. It's like literally it's heaven. And they have a restaurant where you can order chili. And other, I don't remember the, the full menu, but I ordered chili, which you have to order <laughs> chili based on, I mean, we'll talk about it later on in the movie, but, you know. I ordered, Was it good? Okay. Oh. It was decent, but their, <laughs> their sauce made it better. And see, it's a, tex, it's a Texas chili, and I, which means there's no beans in it. And I put beans in my chili. And, I, and it's a big debate. Like, when I first got here and I, <laughs> my first job here... I would talk to people and I brought chili one day for a potluck and they're like, there's beans in it. I'm like, yeah, te- uh, beans has chili. And they're like, not in Texas. I was like, fuck you, whatever. So anyway, damn, let's, let's, let's hear your, uh, do you, is there beans in chili or no? I don't know anything about chili. I, the only thing is my mom used to get it from Wendy's. She let, she used to let me have a couple spoons and okay. that was it. All right. And I've never gone, it had beans in it and I didn't mind it. I was going to say, if somebody gave me chili and it had beans, I would still eat it. But if it didn't have beans, I'd be like, all right, let's see what that's about. It's just soup. It's just soup. I don't, not chili. I don't care. For, I don't care for beans. Anthony, I told you we we're going to be fighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, no. My my grandma spit in my face. I'm like, what kind of Mexican are you? You don't like beans? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> She's like, frijoles? No te gusta frijoles? You fucking bitch. <laughs> But uh, but anyway, so it, to me it was a bit watery, and they also they put corn in it, which I don't fuck with corn in my chili. So, but <laughs> exactly, I've never but, heard of that. But they had a sauce with it. They had like a barbecue sauce that I put in it, and it was really good. But I'm not done. There are cabins <laughs> on the grounds that you can rent and stay overnight, and they even have a little <gasps> amphitheater type setup so you can show movies. So it's like heaven oh on my earth. God. But the thing is, like, there's no one on premises at night. So you are on your own in this pitch black, deserted stretch of road outside of Austin. And uh, I've always wanted to, like, rent that area. Out. There's, like, f- five or six cabins, get five or six couples or friends or whatever, have the place to ourselves, watch movies at night, and then just fucking zone out, vibe out there. You know, I think it would be dope as fuck. But, yeah, that that's the gas station uh, in Bastrop, Texas. Like I said, it's about 45 minutes northeast of Austin. Uh, if you ever have the chance to go, if you're ever in the area, I would definitely recommend it. I could have dropped $200 in there based on everything they had in there. You know, I just didn't have the money at the time, so I ended up buying a couple mm-hmm. dollars in stickers. But, but yeah, uh, definitely recommend the guys. It's so cool that this very important location to this movie is still up and you can go and they respect it. It's not like the Halloween house, which has been moved and now it's an office building, you know, and you, they don't even let you go inside. So, and then, uh, th- there's also the house, the, the Sawyer house that I want to talk about w- once we get there. Cool. Cool. So I'm just going to put my energy into it. Now my horror confessional live show at the gas station. It's Halloween one and two Texas chainsaw massacre one and two and whatever other movies you're going to put a poll out. And whatever movie, <laughs> that'd, that, be so that'd be amazing. And we're gonna find a few dads to man the grill and have some barbecue. <laughs> some dads, they have to have some children because we. This is gonna happen. The carne asada, yeah, yeah, exact, exact. I'll make the al pastor. <laughs> Everybody else, yeah. Somebody needs to make some brisket, rib tips. Uh, <laughs> that this that's actually the site where I think would be a great for like a pod mortem meetup. A pod meetup, if you will. A pod meetup. <laughs> I think it would be so great. I think it would be amazing. Um, yeah. So just put that. I want to put that out in the in the energy. Barbecue meetup. There we go. Let's make it happen. We got the money. We can put the funds together. 
Definitely. Anyway, <laughs> so I love that you've been to this barbecue place because you get to give us some insight that like nobody else has. I say barbecue place, but I mean the historical site. Yeah. <laughs> so we're the disgusting, incredible Hulk van approaches the barbecue space slash gas station. And they're met by Jim Sidow, who we know as either the father or the proprietor or the cook. He lets the group know that the gas station tanks, that the gas tanks are empty. And this is actually something that kind of scared me because I do remember um, when I was in high school about 10-ish years ago, when we were talking about the 1970s, we also talked about gas shortages and how gas stations just had a signs at the front as soon as you could see it, they say, hey, we have no gas. And like during this time, when my history teacher was teaching me about it, this was when gas was reaching $2.50 a gallon, which was ridiculous at that time. Yeah. And now we're happy if gas is two fifty. dollars <laughs> like, it'll, it'll never be two fifty again, you know? Yeah, exactly. Now, if you've ever seen that movie called Fire in the Sky, that alien movie with Travis Walton, gas was $0.97. Cents. So, <laughs> so like, I remember in in high school, when gas was two fifty a gallon, and we we're like, "Oh my god, this is fucking ridiculous!" And my history teacher told us, "Like, hey, in the seventies, there was a gas shortage, and that's kind of what we're looking at right now." And it's just incredibly interesting that like we're kind of in that phase again, where we don't know what's going on with gas. Yeah, and actually, I I don't remember like p- pandemic time is in my head it's it's we've been in this for like 10 years or whatever but <laughs> this might have been pre-pandemic or at the very beginning of the pandemic but there was a oh i think it was pre-pandemic there was a storm coming into austin and there was gonna be like a really bad couple of days and people went bananas and just started gassing up all mm-hmm. the cars and there was lines around the block and people were actually bringing barrels and and buying it like they that. were bringing their uh their trash cans yeah it's like an episode of always sunny you know it was ridiculous yes and yes they, they caused their own gas shortage which was mm-hmm. ridiculous because there was no need for it it was just people panic buying mm-hmm. just like in the beginning of the pandemic with you know, when they were buying toilet, toilet paper. paper and all that shit so yeah that's scary but also i, I wanted to ask you something so you brought it up earlier. Um, the hitchhiker, either it was his blood or ran, um, Franklin's blood, but he 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 marked the side of their car, mm-hmm. so that when they got to the gas station, the old man tells them there's no gas. I, do you think that he saw that mark on the that that's how they communicate that do not sell them any gas? Because what I think is this at the, in the seventies, there's this long stretch of road that you know a bunch of people are going to be stopping at and then you don't sell them gas so they can't get very far. That's, that's a very good question. And honestly, it's very interesting to think about it. But like my my only thing against that is, um, who was it? Jerry, Sally Hardesty's boyfriend, asked, where is there another gas station? And he's like, oh, Newt's is the, the closest gas station nearby. So, like, I think the fact that they were given another gas station kind of says, like, I don't think they were being targeted. I think they fucked up. I think they fucked around and found out. Like, I think the fact that they were even given the name of another gas station, like, oh, well, there's not another gas station for 100 miles and you're not going to make it over there. Like, I think the fact that they weren't persuaded Mm. to stay as if they had no other options, that kind of made me believe. Like, oh, well, they do have other options. I think the only reason they ran out of gas is because they went to the the Hardesty home or the Franklin home, not because they were led in the wrong direction or anything like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the marking of the van with the blood, what do you think? Was that just a weird thing that he did? That bitch is fucking crazy. Who knows what he's doing? Like, oh, my. He was walking around with fucking swamp ass. His ass was wet. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not about to try to decipher what the fuck this guy's doing. He has dead animals on him. He has a fucking coin purse made out of a rodent. Yeah, that was weird. Okay, this guy's doing all kinds of things that I can't figure out. So, all right, I, I'm not about to try to figure out what he's doing. <laughs> so, at the gas station, they're told that the tanks are empty. There's probably going to be some more tonight, or maybe tomorrow morning. That they're advised that they should probably just wait there and fill up their tank. Now, I do want to give a special shout out to the gas station attendant who was only washing the windows 
when his boss was talking to the youths. Like, and it's the, it's the, it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my fucking life. The boss is talking to the people and the washer is washing the windows. And as soon as the boss walks away, so does the window washer. But the, the boss goes back and so does the window washer and goes back to wash. I just thought that was one of the most funniest things. And this goes back to Blood on Satan's Claws. But this goes back to like the simpleton who doesn't speak. Uh-huh. And just the inclusion of that. I'm like, I don't know why you did this, but it's so fucking funny. Not, now I'm going to see which one. Because I remember us talking about a simpleton. Torso, torso, the one who, the guy who couldn't talk. Yes, just last week. That's right, torso. Yes. Um, so Franklin asks the uh, the gas station proprietor, barbecue man, like, "Hey, do you know where the old Franklin home is?" And once the old man learns that their destination is the old Franklin home, he advises them that you probably really don't want to go there. Um, people have absolutely no hesitation showing you that they don't want you in their property. And somehow this leads Franklin to like okay, cool, let's go there. And so, like, even the even the gas station, not the gas station attendant, the gas station proprietor, he's like, hey, I see you have those two foxy girls over there. You know they don't want to see some old decrepit home, right? You know they probably would rather be doing something else. And so, I, this kind of makes me really confused about his character because he seems as if he's trying to get them on their way so they can get the fuck out of there. However, they're, like, planting themselves in that situation yeah so i watched the audio commentary with toby hooper and Gunnar hansen and the director of cinematography whose name is escaping me right now but in it uh i think it was toby hooper was who was saying that the old man the the owner of the gas station at this point he has something happens where he's like he's very rude to them or you know He's one way to them where I think that he's going, he's, he knows that he's going to be choosing them as their victims, you know, or that they're going to be victims later on. And then mm-hmm. he finds out that they have connections to the locals. He says, oh, my, my grandpa oh. used to live over here. And then, oh, my dad actually owns the, the Franklin house or whatever, the Hardesty house or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, Franklin? it is Franklin. Franklin. I found, I found out later Franklin is named after their last name. Right, right. So the Franklin house. So as soon as he hears that, he's like, oh, they're kind of locals. And you see a switch in his eyes. He's like, mm, yeah, do mm-hmm. I want to do this to people who live in the county or have connection to it? And then so that's when he starts the you guys shouldn't go digging around, you know, take these girls out of here. They shouldn't be digging around either. And so I think and even later on, he says that I just can't abide by killing. You know, later on, he, he, he doesn't <laughs> like seeing the killing. He's still a terrible character. But it's just, I, I like the depth of the character here where he has, there's some thought behind it where he's like, maybe not these ones, you know, but but yeah. because they chose to stick around, like you said, they fucked around and found out. Mm-hmm. And honestly, what I really, what I really, really, really like is how the drunk man at the cemetery was like, oh, things happen here about, like, we think he's the harbinger. However, we come to the gas station, we find out, oh, this guy is the one who's actually uh, preventing you from harm. Right. Uh, so it Good the guy who's going to inflict it, yeah. yeah forgot about the harbinger that's right uh, listen uh i saw this movie and all i saw was cabin in the woods i'm like harbinger and but then the old man found, oh you're the har-. like did you i was also, just like point did you also see x <laughs> sort of because there is a white bug we see later okay and there's a white bug in x that's like in the lake and it's like oh with texas plates yeah and we're actually going to be talking about x in a future episode for the patreon so look out for that hey is this an announcement of the patreon it's an announcement of the patreon yeah it's coming patreon's happening we're talking about x and miguel will let you know where you can subscribe you can be a sinner saint or disciple whatever (laughs) he decides are the tiers yeah anthony helped me choose those tiers out i'm hoping to get it out (laughs) in time for um for our season two to drop. And so <laughs> look out for that. I one. didn't help. I'm just like a baby whose mom let him lick the spoon when they make a cake. And I helped. <laughs> no, you're, you're a, uh, you were my muse for that moment. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to go into any, I don't need my head to get bigger than it is, okay. but thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let's go back. So 
The old man at the gas station learns that their destination is the old Franklin home. He advises that they probably really don't want to go there. And everybody who listens to Franklin's like, fuck you. Because somehow I ultimately believe that Franklin had the final say. The only reason that that they're going to the Hardesty home is because Franklin wants to go there. Um, Because especially as we're on our way there, um, Kirk tells him like, hey, if we run out of gas on the way there, you're towing us back in your wheelchair. So I'm led to believe that nobody wants to go there. They're kind of just doing that to appease Franklin, which kind of just causes a little bit more confusion than it it clears up. So they arrive at the old home and Sally and Pam, they go off to look through the abandoned old family homestead. And Franklin, Franklin wants to examine the blood that the hitchhiker left on the van And this nasty motherfucker has a piece of barbecue sausage in his mouth like a fucking cigar, examining the blood. And I'm like, what the fuck is your problem, bro? That's fucking gross. And, like, he's literally holding it in his mouth like a cigar. Also, so we didn't mention this, but, yeah, when they left that gas station, they took barbecue with them, right? They did, yes. So they got the barbecue from the the gas station, (laughs) which is why, oh, yeah, that's right, at the the gas station right now in, in... 2022 they also sell barbecue forgot to say that but (laughs) we come to find out later what that meat is that he's actually eating so it's Mm -hmm. even it's even nastier than what we think about right now you know absolutely and the fact that he's just holding in his mouth savoring the flavor like honestly if it was just a regular sausage that would still be disgusting but the fact that we know what it is now yeah oh man you nasty but on the audio commentary that I heard with Toby, he said, uh, with Toby Hooper, we're on a first name basis, me and Toby. <laughs> right. <laughs> TH, yeah. you know, the guy. <laughs> uh, what's a side panel or side thought, but there's this one, there's a trailer, of an infamous trailer for the, the Funhouse movie, which he directed. And there's a, you know, that in a world, that guy, that voice. <laughs> well, the person. Uh, one man <laughs> is humanity's hope. <laughs> Must go against a whole army. <laughs> all he has is a switchblade. Um, and swamp ass. <laughs> uh, there, so there's some version of the movie in which they're the good guys and these guys in the and Franklin and MRT. Right? <laughs> From their point of view. I don't want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to. Right. But so. Oh, Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper. Yeah, 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 the, the, the trailer. So there's a trailer. That pronounces, and the guy who is in a world, he pronounces Toby's name as Tobe. So he says, and by acclaimed director, Tobe Hooper. And every time I see it, it so they played a lot of Terror Tuesdays for that one line. Everybody fucking cracks up. I, I, I love that part. Tobe <laughs> Hooper. You know, I was gonna I was gonna pronounce his name that way as a joke, but I'm like, that's very low hanging fruit. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure like it's been done several times. Yeah. Like even with the, what did I say earlier? Oh, you remember the Alamo? I'm so glad because I forgot. Like, even that, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> That's that dad humor. You got right there. <laughs> so they're at the... Okay, so where I left off is they're at the home. Franklin is holding a piece of sausage in his mouth like a fucking cigar. Mm-hmm. This is the moment that I decided that I hate Franklin. Okay. Because once again, I don't know if he was directed to act like a child or an adult. But just the fact that you're holding a piece of sausage in your mouth like that, like a cigar, that makes no fucking sense. Even in the 70s, like either eat the shit or you don't. You're being weird and I don't like you. And and in the commentary, Toby Hooper says that he directed this, uh, the actor who's playing Franklin to do a lot of like mouth stuff. And so we have this. What does that mean? Exactly what we see at the movies, so <laughs> like him, him like chomping on this sausage, like a like a cigar, like you're saying. And later on, he's doing raspberries for an extended period of time, like longer than anybody has ever done raspberries, and with more force and hatred behind the raspberries than has ever been done. And that was the the, the direction that was given to him. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So if I ever was, ask a man. Go ahead, go ahead. If I ever ask a man for mouth stuff, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you don't want him to go on your shit. It's like, I don't want him to chew a fucking sausage in his mouth. Yeah. 
Like, what the fuck? Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I really hate about Franklin is that he he finds it really difficult to move around this old family homestead in his wheelchair. And it, it incredibly frustrates me because, one, this was your idea. And, two, it's a little bit bizarre to me that you're expecting everybody else to make your navigating through this place their problem. Like, you recommended this. Why do you think anybody else should, like, wheel you around? And once again, that might sound like an incredibly, like, fucking ableist opinion. But it's like, you su- you suggested we come here and you can't move around. Why would you suggest that? Why aren't you recommending the thing that's probably going to be the easiest for you? Mm-hmm. Does that make any kind of sense? Yeah, or or making sure that you have the necessary help with you like are, are because all, at, they, at that t- at that time it was your it was your responsibility yeah so were they all coupled up i think so right I yes think there were two couples in franklin yeah so he should have been like hey don't leave my side or make sure i'm able to get in all the way or or something but before before he, he lets them escape or something or not escape mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. Let, lets them see the rest of the house but I don't know. There, there's a certain sense of independence that you you would want as a handicapped person. So, I, I can see him kind of because I know for me personally, I'm the first to offer help and the last to accept it, right? And that's, that's <laughs> how I am. And so I can imagine him being the same way, especially if he was born that way. We, we don't know his backstory, but if he was born that way, he's probably like, I can do anything, and I can do anything you can, which you know, right physically speaking isn't always the case and in in and specifically in this situation you know maybe he should have been asking for help he should have known the limits of what he can do and, and been mm-hmm. asking for help. yeah i, I start yeah and like see that and i think one of my biggest issues is that he was expecting help not asking for it yeah like he kept calling for sally like also they're which, not really good friends right they're not good friends to, they, they yeah. know the situation you're in and they bounce as soon as they get like he also had to he had trouble just just getting into the house, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so like the, the friends aren't thinking his own sister isn't thinking. So, and honestly, like, here's my perspective. If you're disabled and you recommend we go somewhere, if it's not accessible, why are you suggesting something that's not accessible? I don't understand that. Like if you had a hard time navigating through this place, why are you suggesting we go there? I just don't get it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm yeah. just saying, like, it, the reason we're here is because of you. Here, here's the thing, and here's why maybe I'm connecting with Franklin a little bit here. <laughs> Do you know how to swim? Yeah. I don't know how to swim. <gasps> what? I, I don't I I was born in Chicago. We didn't have a pool. We went to the lake, but we never went very far into Lake Michigan. You just went up to your calves or, or you know, just you stayed very close to shore, right? I have gone out to sea and been like paddling off of a boat. Like, I don't know how to swim. What do I have doing? What am I doing there? I've gone to, I've gone, what's that called? Um, tube. What's that tube? Uh, tubing, I guess. Tubing mm-hmm. on the, uh, on the, on the Bravos. No, whatever, whatever river is here, the Colorado river in Austin, I think. And almost died. Because I got knocked off of the thing and I wasn't wearing a a life vest this. or anything like that. The only reason why I didn't die is because as soon as I shot on, uh, I hit the ground, I shot back up and grabbed onto the thing. So like <laughs> I, I had to like hold on to it until somebody came, got me and pushed me, pull, pulled me to shore. Right. So I should have, shouldn't have been anywhere near the water because I do not know how to swim or at the very least wearing a life saver. And I, and I wasn't doing that. A life jacket or whatever. And so I, I'm kind of like, I'm vibing with, with uh, Franklin where I'm like, I'm putting myself in a situation in which I have no situ- no uh, right being in or, you know. So <laughs> what I'm saying is sometimes you make stupid decisions. Okay. Yeah, but I, yeah, I should have Franklin is, Franklin's 23, so he's very dumb. <laughs> all right, all right. I can see here that we're going to fight over Franklin as well. That's a, I don't even <laughs> want to be fighting over Franklin because he's not a good character to fight over. But. Right. Yeah. He's my least favorite yeah, personally. Fuck, yeah, I could tell. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All 
So Franklin eventually finds his way uh, into the house, the the old homestead. And he's very annoyed by how much fun everybody else seems to be having. His sister, her boyfriend, his sister's friend, his sister's boyfriend. He's incredibly annoyed by everything that he's hearing. And he just starts doing this like mocking laugh. Like, (laughs) once again, you suggested that everybody comes here. I don't know why you're so annoyed. So at some point, eventually Kirk and Pam were like, hey, do you remember that swimming hole you mentioned earlier? Where's that? To which uh, Franklin responds, oh, well, if you go down the path between those two sheds, you'll find the creek eventually. And unfortunately, Pam and Kirk find out that this um, creek is dried up. However, Kirk does hear the sound of a generator going on. He hears a sound that like catches his attention. And he finds out that that is actually a gas generator. And so he sees that they have a gas generator and he starts thinking, hey, you know what? Maybe I can give them my guitar. Maybe I can give them something, this or the other. That way they can give me a little bit of gas. We can make it to a gas station. We can fill up the tank. And then we can come back and pay them for like the favor that they did us. And... As they're thinking about, as Kirk is thinking about like all these things that they could possibly do, what they notice is uh, the farm, what they notice is a farmhouse that does have quite a few abandoned cars in it. It's covered by a tarp, but that's something that immediately like raises their eyebrow. And now while they see these cars in this sort of parking lot, in this lot covered up, they find a house and they get to the front door of the house. Now, this scene, in my opinion, literally didn't need to happen because if you were smart, if you had your wits about you, you would not be in the situation. So Kirk, they get to Kirk and Pam, they get to the front door. Kirk finds a rotted tooth and decides he wants to play a prank on Pam and puts the tooth in her palm. Oh, I got something for you. And she freaks out. She doesn't like what she just saw, so she decides to distance herself a little bit. And meanwhile, Kirk is still going to stay at the front door, trying to find out if anybody will answer his knocks at the door. So he keeps knocking, and he doesn't really hear anyone respond, but he does hear kind of like pig squeals, animal noises, and for whatever reason, this kind of grabs his attention. And he hears pig squealing and animal noises. And he's like, you know what? I need to make my way in there. So he opens the door and does one of the weirdest things in the entire movie. And he runs down the hallway. He runs down the hallway. And this is the very first time that we are presented with Gunnar Hansen's Leatherface. Kirk runs down the hallway. Leatherface appears. And he's like, what are you doing in my house? And he immediately whacks him in the head with a sledgehammer. And Kirk dies nearly immediately. You know, it only took one whack and this guy was out. (laughs) And what happens next is Kirk is then dragged into a back room and we don't know what happens until a little bit later. But this is Kirk. This is his last hurrah. Bullshit. Weird. Miguel, what do you think? (laughs) So a couple things. First... He he walks into the into the house, but so he's knocking on the door, and he when he's knocking, he's knocking kind of hard, and that dislodges the door. So the door wasn't all the way closed. Just because the door is open does not mean you <laughs> walk into somebody's house that you don't know. I don't know exactly, how that, and maybe this was the first instance, but we've seen it so many times. In fact, we saw it in X, and we saw it in countless other movies since then, right? Mm-hmm. Do not go mm-hmm. into people's houses. Stay outside of their house, right? If you think they're not hearing you, pound on the outside door, ring the doorbell, make noise on the outside. Stay your, stay your ass out of that goddamn house, right? Mm-hmm. So he walks in. So I, I don't think he runs. I think what you're seeing is he trips because there's a, a ramp okay. going into that section. So he trips upwards. I can see that. And while he's looking down. We get this menacing, you know, Gunnar Hansen just filling the whole frame. And he has to, like, duck down to get out of the, out of the, to make it through the door, right? So they added, like, a three-inch heel to Gunnar Hansen. Because he's already a tall dude. (laughs) They added added those lifts to make him even taller than everybody else, right? But 
<clears throat> this, I mean, it's so abrupt and it's so quick. You don't, ex- I mean, you're expecting something bad to happen, but not this iconic, just monster of a human wearing this face that it looks, it, it looks um, like, are you familiar with Uncanny Valley? No, I'm not. Okay, I'm not going to, I don't know the official definition or not, and I'm not going to look it up. But <laughs> to me, it's like uh, Uncanny Valley is when they're trying to make like computer programs or, um, that that, re- that reflect like the human face, like in like in cartoons or, or I'm sorry, in video games, stuff like that. You know how they keep, the technology keeps advancing, so they're trying to make it look, look as realistic as possible. Mm-hmm, There's a the point mm-hmm. where it looks so realistic that it looks fake. And that's the Uncanny Valley. And that's, oh, okay. that's that's what I feel like is happening here. You're seeing this human face, like mask, over an actual human, and you're like, "Holy shit, that is terrifying!" Right? It, it's yeah. I, I obviously I've seen this before. We've all seen Leatherface before. What did you think when you saw for the first time Leatherface coming into into frame? I like, saw like a legit. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go on. I don't. I ask you questions and then I ask you a question. <laughs> no, I just want to. Well, like, no. Were you fucking? Were you terrified or were you like, holy shit? Were you surprised or or, or is this movie you're not feeling it at that much? So you're just like, ah, whatever. I think I'm personally just really grateful that it happened so fast, because what happens is we see this seemingly gigantic figure imposes impose their presence upon somebody and with one whack ends their life. And so like all of it as a whole is like, God damn, if you weren't scared, you need to be scared about how this person handled their business because as soon as they saw you, you were out like a light. And so like, it was very, it was scary to see how you don't even know what's going on, but you're a victim instantly. Yeah. As opposed to other movies where like they're being chased or they're being scared or, you know, it's Jigsaw and they're like, oh, well, if you solve the puzzle, blah, blah, blah. But like with this, there's no, you have no chance of escape. There was never any chance of escape for you. So two things. Um, One, you'll know when he gets hit in the head and he falls instantly to the ground, he starts shivering and shaking. That's exactly what they said happens to mm-hmm. the, cows the cows when they were getting hit in the head with with the mm-hmm. sledgehammer with the sledge. So I like the mm-hmm. correlation there. Secondly, the, at t- till this point, they've just been building tension, right? And typically in a movie, you'll know when the tension is going to be relieved, but. At this, or, or not relieved, yeah, I guess relieved, but also come to a head, right? But in this one, you weren't expecting that shit at all. It's just, mm-hmm. yeah, I just thought it was expertly crafted. It's just amazing, and I, and I love it. But an, another thing I wanted to mention was that this movie has been working towards this kind of like Halloween, where not a lot has been happening so far, except for tension. Um, same thing with Halloween, like, except in the beginning, you know, where he kills his sister. Uh, and then he escapes, but there's a lot of stuff in the middle that does uh, nothing happens until the night. And I kind of feel like that's what was happening here as well. Is there mm-hmm. they're building that tension, and then now you know you're in the fucking movie. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I personally, I love a slow burn. Honestly, you will never turn me. If you say slow burn, I'm gonna watch it because I'm like <laughs> I'm boring too. Let's see what's going on. So you heard it here, Anthony loves slow burn. So. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Hey, I'll tell you right now. I think I'm bo- I think I'm a boring person. If you a slow burn, I'm interested. Okay. I'm tell I'm telling you right now. Anthony, <laughs> if we were recording live, I would like throw my teeth at you <laughs> because you're not a boring person. Hey, listen, I know who I am. I know what I'm about, son. Okay. I think I'm I'm fairly boring. So <laughs> I love I love slow shit so much and like there is there is no part of this movie that feels like a waste of time, which is something that I'm incredibly appreciative of. So, like, it might be a slow burn, whatever, but, like, ultimately, everything leads up to where we're getting, and it's worth it, in my opinion. It's totally worth it. Yeah. So, where we're at now, Kirk has just been killed by Leatherface, and now Pam 
is kind of restless and annoyed about how she hasn't seen Kirk in the last few minutes. And Kirk has not yet returned from his time knocking on the door, a.k.a. slash getting killed. And she goes into the house. She goes into the house and decides that she wants to investigate what's going on. Now, as soon as she walks into the house, she stumbles upon a room that's filled with like human bones, animal bones, live chickens dangling from cages in the walls, um, sculptures made out of human skulls hanging from the ceiling as well. And what we see in this scene as she's viewing all of these kind of like horrific sights it's very reminiscent of the horrific sights that was being talked about in the radio announcements from earlier in the movies. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, there's uh, crude body parts put together in ways that shouldn't be. And there's really, there's body parts rotting all over the place. And so, like, that's kind of something that we're witnessing as she's in this (laughs) absolutely disgusting room. Now... Like I said, the floor is covered with, like, bones and feathers, and Pam begins to, like, she's, it's almost as if she's, like, gonna throw up, and she starts screaming, and, like, Leatherface suddenly appears and lunges for her, and, like, she runs out, like, she's trying to run, like, she's trying to run out, like, she's very disgusted, she sees Leatherface, and she's like, you know what, I'm gonna head the fuck out. So, like, she runs out of the house, and when, in one of the most iconic horror movie scenes, in my opinion, is she does escape the house. However, Leatherface grabs her by the waist, and, like, her shoes pop off, and <laughs> Leatherface just carries her back into the house, and she's screaming. And one of the things that's, like, one of the worst parts about this movie is, like, Leatherface carries her into the house where her boyfriend had just been killed, and he puts her on this fucking meat hook. Oh, and this shit looked painful as fuck. Miguel, tell me what you think. So, here's the thing. You don't, in my mind, since I've seen this movie, it's probably been a decade. In my mind, we always see the hook going into her flesh, right? Mm-hmm. That does not happen here. You don't see any of that. You see the hook. You see her being placed on the hook, like, fr- from the front. And then you see blood, but you, a splatter, but you don't never see the hook pierce the flesh, and that's you don't need it. The mind creates that for you, and it's fucking amazing, like devastating, like like you're saying, iconic shot of her running out of the house uh, from the screen door and him bursting past and grabbing her back in, fucking mm-hmm. amazing shot. But I also wanted to, sh- to talk about the shot of her walking in. There's that shot uh, from beli- from be- from below from the ground. She gets up from the swing, and the the camera follows her from the back from behind her, looking up like it's be- it's like a booty shot, basically, right? She's, <laughs> she's, riding, she's rocking the short shorts, and she's walking into the house very slowly, slowly, and it helps to make the for me it melts helps to make the house a character. Because now this there's this huge imposing house that you don't know what's what's inside, and there's this you know small woman who's walking into her by herself. It's just like her walking into the mouth of hell or something like that, right? It's just mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. An absolutely iconic shot as well. So it's like two iconic shots, or or even like this whole fucking scene is just iconic. Like her walking in. Her running out, Leatherface grabbing her, and then him putting her on the hook. Just fucking devastating series of events, right? Absolutely peak horror. Like, Mm -hmm. some of the best horror you will ever see, right? I agree with you. I'm I'm right there with you. Yeah, and and one thing I I also wanted to mention was for that hanging, uh, for, for Pam's meat hook death scene, the actress act was actually held up by a nylon cord that went between her legs and then which were padded with maxi pads. So that's their rudimentary like rig that they put up. And even despite the padding, it's, it was still quite, it was really painful for her. So she decided to use that pain to make her, per, uh, her performance more believable, but uh, she was working. Right? Okay. What the, yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. But, but like I always, that's wondered, an artist. That's an artist. Exactly. And, and, and I was wondering, I, I was still was like, this is 1974. How'd they do it? There's no wires. You can't see any wires. And all <laughs> a that. lot of pain. Yeah. And a lot of threats. 
Yeah. So yeah, I I love this shot. Like when I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this and the end scene is what I think of. So we're back at the Hardesty house with Jerry, Sally, and Franklin. And they're starting to wonder why Pam and Kirk hadn't returned. Now, as the sun sets, Jerry decides he's going to go out and look for help. He's going to go down the creek where Pam and Kirk went to try to find them and see if he can possibly find out what happened to them. So, But before we get to Jerry actually traveling through the woods and going on through his own journey, we actually see um, Sally and Franklin have a conversation. And in my opinion, it's kind of clear how Franklin possibly views himself as kind of a burden. He asks Sally, like, are you mad at me or this, that, or the other? And Sally even says, like, no, I'm just tired. And Franklin asks her, like, did you really mean it when you invited me? Which I kind of understood, like, hey, it's the 70s. There's nobody who's going to send you a fake invite because you're in a wheelchair. That means they're going to have to take care of you at some kind of point. They're going to have to look after you. They're going to have to worry about your safety. I don't think his invitation, in my opinion, I don't think his invitation was given as sort of like a, oh, well, you can come if you want. You know, I like a pity invite or something. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, he's in a wheelchair. You're going to have to, you know, pull out the ramp. You're going to have to ramp him out. You're going to have to make sure this guy's taken care of. I I personally don't think the invitation is just all willy nilly. However, I don't know. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a, and we'll see later on that they don't have the best relationship as brother and sister. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I can see where he would be feeling a bit like unwanted. And I'm sure that comes with just living a life as, a, you know, a disabled person. Mm-hmm. Feeling perhaps, you know, we don't know this character and I don't want to put anything in, in his mouth or whatever. Well, no, uh, what? What? Uh, oh, you don't? No. no uh, well, he's already what? his mouth is already filled with the the other meat tube. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, uh, perhaps uh, as a handicapped man in the '70s, where things were harder, it's only one year after the ADA was passed, right? And so, yeah, like maybe he did feel like a burden to to his sister, or maybe he was just confiding in her. They maybe maybe they're having a nice sibling moment, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is just another scene where I really don't understand if Franklin was directed to act like a child or an adult because I just I I just can't understand where he's coming from. Like I don't know if he wants the situation to be taken care of or I don't know if he wants himself to be taken care of. So I really don't know where he's coming from. And so he's very frustrated, he's very scared, he's very upset. And the thing that, like, I just can't stop thinking about is the only reason that you all are there is because of you. You wanted to go to your grandpa's old home. You wanted to go to the family's old home. Nobody else wanted to. At the very least, a few people wanted to stay at the gas station until the gas station tanks got uh, refilled. And then they can go ahead and do whatever. But, like, in my opinion, I don't understand where you're coming from, like, Nobody wanted to do this other than you. Nobody was like on Franklin's side. Yeah, let's go see your grandparents' home. Like nobody was on his side. So I don't understand where he thought he wasn't responsible for anything. It's like if somebody's mad at you, it makes total sense because like nobody wanted to be here. But they they listened to you for whatever reason. He could also be doing that like, yeah, I know I fucked up, but... I don't really want you to be, and I know you're probably mad at me, but you know, <laughs> please don't be mad at me sort of thing. Like being very coquettish with it sort of thing. But I, I agree. I, like he, he was acting childish here. Like mm-hmm, just trying mm-hmm. to suss out whether or not she was angry at him. Exactly. So like, after we see this argument between like Sally and Franklin, we cut to Jerry. He's walking through the forest. He's trying to find help. He's trying to go through the exact same path that Kirk and Pam went through so he can, you know, find them and see what happened. And he eventually finds himself upon the the murder house, the terror house. Mm-hmm. 
And <laughs> one of the things that lures them in is the gas generator, like that, that, that lowered in Kirk as well. And so he knocks on the door. He's trying to find out who's there. Hello, it's me. Hello, can you help me out? And one of the things that kind of turns him off is he sees Kirk's towel slash blanket just hanging over some sort of banister. And it's like, oh, wow. So Kirk was here before, but like, why don't I see Kirk? And and like one of the most grandest displays of white privilege, Jerry just walks into the house like, hello, what's going on? What's happening here? And it's like, listen, I'm not walking into anybody's home. <laughs> like, listen, even if I have permission, I need you to tell me, hey, yeah, walk in before I walk into your place. Like, I need you to tell me it's OK <laughs> before I think I can just do that. So, <laughs> Yes. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and I have a scenario to bring up. Okay. So way back in 2000, 2009, my wife and I bought our first house in Chicago or suburbs of Chicago. And we were having a home housewarming. And in order to get not, you know in good with our neighbors, ingratiate with ourselves with our neighbors, we invited them over. It was a young, or not a young couple, I'm sorry, an older couple. They're, they had one child and they had already moved out. And so it was just them. And so we invited them to come over, never thinking they'd come over. So the night of the party, and, and I'm I'm very young at this time, like we're still like drinking heavily and getting drunk and whatever, <laughs> loud music. And so we were inside and if we, we've already been there for a couple hours and we're all like vibing, laughing, joking, talking, smoking, drinking. And all of a sudden, every, so everybody we know is already there. All of a sudden, the front door opens up. And literally, everybody stops. It was one of those record scratch moments. <laughs> everybody stops and looks at the door like, who the fuck is this just opening the door? And they walk in and say, hey, hey, how's it going? Like, you didn't ring the doorbell. You didn't knock. <laughs> like, I'm mad at my friends for not locking the door, the last, the last person that walked in, right? Mm -hmm. still, like they just walked in and knocked and i was like who the fuck does that and then later on i was talking to somebody and they're like yeah that's that white person shit so that's what you were talking about here it's like that just walking in people's houses it's crazy i i hear stories about uh, a lot of things where it's like oh well i left the door unlocked and somebody walked in and i'm like wait hold on why did you, why did you yeah. leave the door unlocked yeah take my card because the door was unlocked that's yeah. <laughs> in my defense, people were walking in and out smoking, right? And so there's no smoking in my house. I don't like that smell in my house. And so I had no control over who was the last one. But to just walk into somebody's house, I was like, yo, what the fuck? That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And to this day, I have friends, close friends, who just walk into my house. <laughs> I'm like, this ain't Seinfeld, okay? Right. Oh. <laughs> this ain't <Let> Snapple. <laughs> this ain't friends, dude. Like you gotta announce yourself, right? Please, I need a, I need at least a two-hour warning, <laughs> at least. And then and they'll tell me like, "Hey, just just walk in." I'm like, "No, I'm not doing that. I'm not. <laughs> I'm I'm knocking first, giving you a couple seconds, and then and then I'll walk in if you told me to." So it's funny that you mentioned it because I've always felt the same way. Like, why? Who are you? Just you don't pay any bills in this house. Why the fuck are you walking into somebody's house? Like, even people I've invited, they need to knock. So yeah. I know they're here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It's weird. Sorry. So he does no, this No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. So one of the weird things is that we hear giggling from the front door, and Jerry is like, oh, what's that? What's going on? And for some reason, Jerry accepts this as an invite to walk into the house. And he sees a lot of things that kind of just, like, disturb him he sees a bloody hook that we see that we know that pam was hung on earlier and he hears this sort of knocking and understands like oh somebody's in the freezer and he opens the freezer and this is kind of something that i really don't understand i don't know if this person was frozen and was kind of just reacting as a result of not being frozen i don't know if it was nerves but like Jerry opens the freezer and here comes Pam wailing frantically. 
and this totally scares Jerry. It scares him to the point where he wants to run away, and it scares him to where the <laughs> as he runs into the hallway, he sees Leatherface and just immediately starts screeching. Bitch, same. Yeah. Because <laughs> he starts screeching and Leatherface hits him in the head once and he's out. Yeah. Just <laughs> just just the presence that um that Gunnar Henson has. It's just fucking incredible. And yeah, this scene again is it's terrifying because what I think happened was it's not Sally. Who who's in the um who, who Pam Pam so Pam I think she was like passed out due to shock and he opens it and she just had she's like waking up very slowly and she wakes up at that point and that's what happens there what I think is most interesting is immediately afterwards when Leatherface um knocks out the dude and Jerry Jerry mm-hmm. and and the guy falls to the floor Leatherface starts looking around for other people like he's like looking yes. around, like yo, what the fuck? Where are these motherfuckers coming from? You know, it's like the third dude that I had to take take down. And so he's today, making, today, and like he's making noises. He's like, I'm not gonna make the noises, but but uh, he's making the <laughs> Thank noises, you. like looking around, and um, yeah, it's 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 a very um, very humanizing. It's very weird to say for Leatherface, right? But. It's humanizing that he can also be scared, right? Because he's he's scared of other people coming around. And there's this one scene where he runs towards the gate. I'm uh, sorry, towards the window to look out. And uh, there's a there's a chicken in a cage there for whatever reason. I, yes. Uh, and he uh, he goes by and he swats at it and he misses it once. So he swats at it again. Well, that was by, uh, by direction of Toby Hooper. He told he told him to do that. And so uh, yeah. I just it, it's funny to see like direction coming from Toby Hooper that was, like, <laughs> trying to make it even weirder. Like you already have this chicken in a cage. Now you want the chick going and the chicken going off. And yeah, I just I liked immediately afterwards seeing Leatherface be scared. I thought that was really cool. No, yeah, that was actually very interesting because we I don't think we ever really get to see our uh, quote unquote antagonist experiencing fear. Yeah. So I thought that was actually like incredibly interesting because they let me know like, oh, we have absolutely no idea what's going on with this person. Yeah. Uh, you know, with Freddie, Jason, Michael, like, hey, they're out here to handle their business. But like Leatherface, he's not as, what's the word? He's not as like forceful or like sure in his position. Everybody else is like, nah, I'm going to fuck you up. But like Leatherface is like, do I want to fuck you up? Uh... Yeah, you can definitely tell that uh, throughout the movie, later on in the movie, you'll see that Leatherface's driving force isn't to want to kill. He's a murderer, yes. He's a serial killer, yes. But that's coming from his family. His family controls him, right? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So that that's why you see a, a bit more of like a human side of him. Still a monster, still still a still a serial killer, mm-hmm, still a murderer, mm-hmm. but he is obviously developmentally disabled. Uh, I apologize if that's the wrong term. I, I don't know what the right term is, but he's um, he's stunted in his in his intellect, and so that's you could see that he he's not fully in charge here. Somebody else is absolutely. So here we are. It's nightfall, and Sally and Franklin are incredibly they're growing worried that jerry hasn't returned yet now franklin keeps insisting that he and sally should probably just go to the gas station and look for help and sally doesn't want to leave without jerry because you know what do we know she's one of the things that we know about about sally is that she's not trying to push franklin down the hill she is not trying to push him around in his wheelchair and like quite honestly that makes a little sense coming from the sibling of someone who's disabled. Like, Hey, I know what it's going to take for us to get to a certain place. And I don't want to do that. Honestly, I probably don't have the energy to do that. And it's a little bit bizarre for me 
for Franklin to think that like, oh yeah, well, my sister will just carry me down. It's like, you're incredibly dependent. And it's like, hey, this this person like can't do that for you. However, Franklin just expects to be taken care of. Does that seem weird? Well, he's the one who wants to go back to the gas station, all right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So in this instance, I think that's the first instinct instance of him actually doing the right thing. Where going back to the gas station, well, even though later on we'll know that they probably wouldn't have been safe at the gas station either. Mm-hmm. Right? But but we didn't he there's no way for them to know that now. And it's he he was trying to do the right thing here and Sally it's that's understandable as well. She doesn't want to leave her boyfriend, but like she's the one who then later puts them in a situation where she's pushing him through all this brush and bramble, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, I think it's a combination of the two. I think it's a combination of, of Franklin, unfortunately being in the wheelchair and having needing help and her also not making the right decision. And so, so yeah. we'll get there in a second when, when you say what happens next. No, yeah, yeah, I, I can totally see that. So Franklin has a flashlight and Sally keeps like saying, hey, can I have a flashlight? And Franklin, Franklin wants to know why. And like Sally won't tell him. However, <laughs> she's really trying not to explain to the, she's really trying not to explain to Franklin like, hey, give me the fucking flashlight so I can leave and find out what the fuck is going on. And Franklin just gives the biggest fight. And she's, like I said, she's really not trying to push Franklin around in his wheelchair. And so eventually Franklin is like, you know what? Let me just honk the horn. Let me see if the keys are here. Let me find out if we can just, you know, draw his attention. And so he tries to honk the horn several times and Sally is not having it. She's like, you're drawing way too much fucking attention to us. I need you to stop all this right now. And like Franklin really doesn't understand it. And that's kind of like what put a strike against Franklin for me. It's like, hey, things are going on and you're drawing attention to yourself and you don't know why. It's a little weird. You're you're already beefing with Franklin. And then you put me in a situation where I got to back Franklin up here. But I think they're both both making dumb decisions. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree. And like what happens is Sally says like, I don't want to carry you down the hill. She literally doesn't have the strength or the energy. So she just decides that she's going to walk and try to find Jerry on her own. And this is when Franklin decides, you know what? I'm just going to walk with you. Hopefully we can figure something out. And it's to me, it's a very brother sister argument where like, they say they're not going to do something, but ultimately they understand like, okay, you know what? Fuck you. I'll bring you along, blah, blah, blah. And this is another situation where I didn't understand where, how old Franklin was supposed to be because like, he has a really weird voice here where he's like, Sally, Sally, wait a minute, Sally. And I was like, what the fuck are you, uh, what the fuck are you doing? Like you're too old for that. (laughs) It's funny you say that because that's how everybody else on a set felt with this character because he, he would do a method. He was a method actor. And so he, so he never broke character. And I believe it was Gunnar Hansen who was like, who said like, he fucking hated this guy. And then he met him like years later. uh, He saw him again years later after the movie had come out or whatever. And he was a completely different character. And he's like, Oh, he was method acting. And so they were friendly after that, but on the set people hated him. I believe it. I understand why. (laughs) So Sally and Franklin are traveling through the woods and they see a light. And we, what we know is this is, this is the light of the The Sawyer house, Leatherface house. Yeah. Sawyer house, Sawyer house, but they don't know that. And so as they're traveling through the woods, eventually what happens is, uh, Franklin is attacked by Leatherface. Actually, he's the only person in this movie who's attacked by Leatherface's chainsaw while he's alive. Mm -hmm. Like this is the only person, this is the only person killed in the Texas chainsaw massacre by a chainsaw. Yeah. And so like at this point in time, (laughs) at this point in time, this is when pretty much all of Sally's lines are her screaming and yelling. (laughs) She has a couple lines, but from this point forward, it's mostly her screaming. Yeah. For the rest of the movie. 
But yeah, can we talk about this kill on Franklin? Absolutely fucking brutal. Like, what did you think? Because they're in the um, they're in the woods, they're in this bramble, and Sally's mm-hmm. having to push him through this. I can't imagine how hard it was, and she had to physically do it. The actress did. Mm-hmm. And um, so they like they don't turn a corner, but Franklin says, "What is that?" What is, and they they look to the left. Boom! All of a sudden, huge as life, fucking Leatherface, and without hesitation, just fucking chainsaw in the gut. And we don't even see it, right? We just, we get, in mm-hmm. our, our mind makes us think what it is. And it's, for me, it's fucking brutal. Like, excellent mm-hmm. kill. Mm-hmm. I want to know, what, what did you think when you, what did you think when you saw this? Honestly, I think at this point they made Franklin so unlikable that I think they made me want to root for his kill. <laughs> Cold-blooded, but, uh, but, but that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> because Franklin's fucking annoying. He's the worst character. <laughs> yeah he's pretty bad <laughs> so i think they're like hey well this guy's gone now i'm like yeah fuck yeah hell yeah <laughs> buddha bitchy body <laughs> <laughs> so as sally watches her brother being mur- murdered she's screaming for way longer than she should be because she should be running <laughs> she's just there screaming and eventually she decides to start running through the woods uh, she's running, she's running, she's running, and the entire time Leatherface is literally on her fucking ass, and she eventually finds herself to the gas station that they were at the beginning of the movie, and this is where she finds the old man, aka known as the father, the cook, uh, that guy, and he's like, oh, you know what, no, 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 I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna help you, you're gonna be totally fine, everything's gonna be okay, and he leaves, So he leaves and he returns in his truck and enters the room where Sally is trying to relieve herself. And we find out that he has a burlap sack with rope in it. You know, help. (laughs) It's exactly how he wants to help Sally. Like you do. Um, As one does. As one does. (laughs) So she... She's not down for it. She understands that this guy is trying to put her in a position that she shouldn't be in. And so she immediately grabs a knife that's closest to her. And she's like, you know what? This is how I'm going to defend myself. And some way, somehow, the old man takes a broom and pushes the knife out of her grasp and then beats her unconscious with that broom. This was disrespectful. Very, the way, very. The way he just used the broom, like, it's very dismissive, like, man versus woman. Like, I was, he was able, very easily able to dis- disarm her. And then mm-hmm. use the broom to just slap her in the face and then, yeah. and then <laughs> take, take the hard part of the So he was using the, 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 the actual broom part where you sweep things up with to hit her. Mm-hmm. That was disrespectful, and then he just started hitting her with the with the wooden part of it, and that's what knocked her out. And uh, yeah, it's it's it was a bit funny, a tiny bit funny, but also really like fucked up. And one one thing I wanted to go back real quick and say that the um, the chainsaw when he was chasing her through the woods, fucking that was terrifying. Like that was yeah, very yeah. scary, and it did go on for an extended period of time, which was maybe they didn't need to go on that long, but. But it was a great scene, and um, one of the things I thought was funny uh, when we were t- when I was listening to the uh, director's commentary is that she was a very slow runner, and Gunnar Hansen has really wide strides, <laughs> and so he was constantly catching up with her. So he that makes ha- so much sense. Yeah, so he would have to slow down, and there's even one scene where like he's about to catch her, and he stops and just starts uh, chainsawing some branches to kind of like. Because he was like, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to catch her every fucking time, you know? <laughs> and then there's another time, uh, it's, it's actually coming up later on after she escapes this part, where um, he slipped. He wasn't wearing, he was wearing boots, but they didn't have any grip on it. And so he slipped and knocked himself unconscious and gave, him, gave himself a bad <laughs> uh, a, a bad gash in his, in his head or something. So he started being very careful 
making turn uh making turns like corners and stuff like that and so you can see it kind of looks very there he was saying it looks very keystone copish where like she runs and makes a quick turn and he instead of doing like a, a circle he does a 90 degree a 45 degree angle you know because he's he's being very <laughs> careful so when you read that sort of stuff you like you can see the actor and the acting in leatherface and i just thought that was really dope I love that, yeah. But yeah, uh, going back to the, the scene uh, in, in the gas station, um, yeah, he he grabs her and ties her, knocks her up, ties her up, and mm-hmm. you know, put her in the mm-hmm. car. And I just felt so bad for her. Like I can imagine, she was just screaming for five minutes <laughs> through the thing, and like you said, she just, she keeps screaming throughout the rest of the movie. So. Yeah, and it's a little interesting how like the old man just like keeps poking her with the stick, like eh, shut the fuck up. That is so fucked up. <laughs> Once he puts her in the car and then he starts driving, the the look on his face of like he's enjoying torturing this woman. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Just, like, po- and you, the, oh man, it's so fucked up. It's yeah, it's it's terrible. The this is a fucked up movie. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's family. <laughs> This whole family needs to be wiped from the earth. Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, I'm totally down. So the old man drives Sally back to the murder house, the house that we know is the murder house. And as he's approaching the house, they notice the hitchhiker. We know that this is the hitchhiker from earlier. However, the man who's driving the car steps out and starts beating the hitchhiker accosting him for nearly getting caught for hanging out at the, at the cemetery also how dare you leave your brother alone how dare you be at the cemetery you almost got caught so this is where we learn that the hitchhiker we saw earlier was actually far more nefarious than we originally thought yeah and like i said the hitchhiker is immediately beaten by this man the cook the father and we find out that the home that they're approaching, that's actually where Leatherface lives. That's where this old man lives. That's where the hitchhiker lives. So if they thought they were in the clear in regards to trouble, no, it's just begun. And we find out that the father the father is mad about several things. And none of these things involve the gruesome murders that we've just witnessed. The father chases the father chases Leatherface with like a stick, ready to whoop some ass. And almost got his ass whooped. And the, the father was asking, like, hey, did anybody get caught? Did, did, did you leave anybody left to go run around? And Leatherface, in, like, their own way, was like, no, 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 no. Whoever is killed is in the freezer, but whoever is not in the freezer is getting cooked. That's the message that I got from Leatherface. And the father was like, well, you still fucked up the door, so I'm going to whoop your ass. And I'm like, God damn, that's some fucking parent of color type shit. Like, if I can't get you on shit I think you've done, I'm going to get you on shit that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. You still, uh, you're being punished for um, the the emotion that you made them feel. So you made them feel. Exactly. So not what you actually <laughs> did, but for the emotion they made you feel. Um, one thing I wanted to say was, he says, look what your brother did to the door. And it's like, th- then you know you're in fucking trouble because he knows that this, this leather face is who he is. And um, that's what he's concerned about. He's concerned about the door. It's like, oh, fuck, man. This family is fucked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So eventually what happens is this family forces Sally to join them for dinner. And this meal, we come to find out, is clearly made up of human flesh and they decide that they want to bring their grandpa down that fucking totally decrepit grotesque man that we saw earlier oh now this man gets to join join us for dinner now what they do is they slice sally's finger so blood starts coming out and they put her finger in this old man's mouth and this old man has the greatest time I've ever seen an old man have. And he's like Mrs. Mac in Black Christmas. Like, mm, 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 mm. he's enjoying, he's drinking, he's having the time of his life. And I, quite frankly, I don't know how we got there. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, I was listening to the audio commentary and, and on it, Gunnar Hansen recalls like a, a really fucked up story. So, 
they were shooting okay. they were shooting this scene um it was like a 27 hour work day they only had like two weeks to to shoot and so they were trying to get everything in and i think the, i think they pretty much shot it in, in, in is it called in sequence um sequentially yeah they like it they shot the beginning of the movie at the beginning, the middle, the middle, and the end of the end for for the most part. Uh, I know there's a term for it, and I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> but um, so by the end, they were completely tired, and they had this last like 27 hour shoot where they had to fill all this stuff in, and it would stank. They had the food in there, the the um, the lights were causing everything to be like really hot in there, along with the Texas heat, and so the 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 meat was rotting. And everybody smelled at the, at the end of the <laughs> shoot. And so people were actually fainting and getting nauseous and getting sick. And so at the end of the day, like uh, Gunnar Hansen recalls like shooting the sequence where he, where they cut Sally's finger and tried feeding the blood to grandpa, the tube that shot the, the fake blood kept clogging. And finally, after several takes without the tube working right, he actually sliced her <gasps> finger open. Oh my God. God, and he says at that at the reason was at this point we were insane. He says that his only desire at that point in shooting was to get the film done. He didn't care about his fellow actors' well being, and this sequence was shot in the back end of a twenty seven hour workday. And he also notes that there isn't much acting going on in the in the dinner scene. They're all just really fucking. <laughs> I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. I'm just very disappointed that I was correct. <laughs> yeah, and there, there's even one part later on in, in, the, in the dinner scene where um, I think it's either the old man or the hitchhiker tells Leatherface to kill her, to, to kill Sally, right? And Gunner says that for a couple, for like two seconds, as soon as he heard that, he got up and was going to kill her. Like he felt like he could he, he could kill her. Then he remembered, oh shit, what am I doing? We're we're doing we're we're filming a movie. That's how fucking insane they were at this point. I'm shocked, but not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so the grandfather is sucking the blood out of her finger, enjoying each drop as he gets a taste. And this is kind of where Sally passes out. And we see Sally kind of wake up again at the dinner table. And everybody has a place setting. It's the hitchhiker, Leatherface, the cook, and the grandfather with Sally at the head of the table. She, like, kind of blacks in and immediately is like, I don't want anything to do with this. And just, like, starts, continues screeching. <laughs> Not starts, continues screeching. Yeah. And so... As she starts screeching, Leatherface and the hitchhikers start joining her, and they screech as well. And this is one of the most horrifying things. It's like, if you're screaming because you're in pain, and then your assailant starts mimicking you, I'm like, oh. Mocking. So I have no, they're yeah, mocking. I have no way out of here. <laughs> yeah. They know that they're in, um, they're in control, and that you can't do anything. It's kind of like, I, I can't remember where, where this trope came from, but when you're screaming and the killer says, go ahead, scream. I'll scream with you. And they're like, ah, oh. mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that is the worst feeling in the world. And just imagine this nightmare that she wakes up into just absolutely horrific. Uh, yeah. We didn't mention that earlier when she was running, when she was running away from, uh, from Leatherface when he was chasing her, she jumped through a window. Right, she full fledged just because it happens twice in the movie. It happens okay. once at the at, after dinner, and it happens again early. And I don't remember <laughs> where, where it was, but yeah. So this actress is it um, Marilyn Burns playing Sally? Like she went through a lot of shit for this film. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, her jumping out of the um, out of the window was one of my favorite parts of the movie. But yeah, she wakes yes. up in this, in this fucking nightmare. I, I don't know how I would react to this. I would probably pass out. I, I don't know. Same. I would pass out again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm like, oh, I'm at dinner with cannibals. Fuck. Pass out. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they start mimicking me? Like, that's rude. That's rude. They're making fun of me? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't have, I can't handle it. No. <laughs> 
So as Leatherface and the hitchhiker join in on the fun, the cook tells them to stop. And like as much as they want to continue tormenting Sally, they still listen to the cook and they do eventually stop. And this is where Sally is they this is <laughs> this is where they tell Sally, like, hey, you know, our grandpa used to work at the slaughterhouse and he was actually one of the best ones there was with the sledgehammer. Actually one of the best ones that there it well one of the best ones that there will ever be. Mm-hmm. And this is when they decide that they want to let the grandpa sledgehammer Sally to death. And what they do is they untie Sally from her restraints. They force her head over a bucket and they grab their feeble ass grandfather and try to make him hold a sledgehammer so he can bash her head in. Now, as they try to make the grandfather bash Sally's head in, the grandfather just lets go of the sledgehammer because honestly, he's 400 years old. <laughs> he, lit- he, he literally does not have the strength. So like you're literally forcing this man to do something that he can't do. And so eventually this happens so many times where the grandfather just will not, cannot bash in Sally's head. The hitchhiker is like, you know what? Fuck this shit. I'll do it myself. And so he tries to do it. And this is when Sally suddenly breaks free luckily for her she's like oh you know what fuck that you're trying to bash my head in i'm out of here and so she hurls herself out the window yeah and listen if any of you know anything about wigs this is (laughs) on this woman's way out of the window this wig was it was a lot robin it was a lot so i don't go on i'm sorry miguel no 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 so like was it like i I don't know anything about wigs was it falling off like could you see like half <laughs> brown hair, half blonde hair or something? Or It was just so big okay. and covering the shoulders. It was like, oh, so you're covering up a man's physique. <laughs> okay, I got it. Was like, I got you. Sally Hardesty did not have that hair. All of a sudden she has fucking um, Farrah Fawcett. Okay. Full on. <laughs> yeah. A, a blowout not- or something. Very that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, and so, also, sorry, real quick. I just wanted to mention the chair that she was tied to, did you see that it had human hands on it? I didn't. Oh my gosh. I've I seen yeah. this movie five times. Yeah. So like where her hands were resting right underneath was another set of hands. It, it was, it looked fucking crazy. And the legs, I believe the legs had legs as well. It was very literal. <laughs> this chair. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So in our final scene, Sally jumps out of the window. She's running for her dear life. Now, as she's running for her dear life, the hitchhiker and Leatherface actually chase after her. And they are not having much luck at all. Sally finds herself in the middle of the highway. And the hitchhiker catches up with her. Now, as the hitchhiker catches up with her and is grabbing her hair and is trying to basically hold her in position so he can slaughter her. They see a big rig show up. And (laughs) this is some of that 70s bullshit where the hitchhiker does everything he can to make sure he doesn't get hit by the big rig. And that's do nothing and let it happen. The big rig is on its way. He just stares at it, holds his hands out in front of him and gets completely destroyed. So now one of Sally's potential assailant has been eliminated that still leaves Leatherface. now the truck driver a truck driver has already killed the hitchhiker so the truck driver slows down and gets out of his rig with the words black maria on his shirt i don't know what that meant but i know that i liked it yeah miguel <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> no i was gonna say do you have any insight I don't. I, I should have looked it up, but I, I didn't. I, I just thought it was something dope, you know? Same. Um, so the hitchhiker is chasing after Sally down their driveway before they get to the highway. Mm-hmm. And um, as we talked about earlier, he, he had his switchblade, not his switchblade, I'm sorry, his razor blade, his straight razor, mm-hmm. and is just cutting the shit out of her back. And you, mm-hmm. and I'm wincing the whole time, cause, again, because it's the straight razor. I'm like, oh, fuck, that's like I could just imagine how much blood and how deep those cuts are and every oh, but again, we also talked they could be it could be a rusty razor as well. So mm-hmm. so that 
in itself is terrifying. And then we get where, where they jump into the, to the middle of the highway and he gets run over. And is that like, it's a pretty good effect, but also it's really, it's also really cheesy. <laughs> like you could tell it's a mannequin. Heavy cheese. Yeah. You can tell it's a mannequin or something like that, but it just gets absolutely destroyed by under the, the wheels of this 18 wheel. Mm-hmm. Then we get this dope ass, uh, what's it called big Maria or what was it again? Black Maria. Black Maria, right. The Black Maria, and then we get this black truck driver in the mm-hmm. tightest 70s shirt and tightest <laughs> 70s pants. Like, literally tight, not cool. They were tight. <laughs> right. Like, yeast infection central. <laughs> yes. You know, you're like, but but he was rocking it. He, he was looking cool. He runs out of He looked good. Yeah. This also was terrifying for me because he gets out of the car. He goes to help. And he sees Leatherface running. And what does he do? He's like, fuck no, fuck no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He runs away. <laughs> where, <laughs> where your ass should have gone away, you know? But the thing is, they also run back to the truck. Yeah. Where, like, they could have escaped because Leatherface was just scraping the door. They didn't need to go out through the other end of the door. They could have just left. Yeah, I didn't understand that Leatherface had the chainsaw revving. And like you said, was pushing the, and you could tell that it was real because it was leaving scratches mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. in in the in this metal door and it's it just like you're saying we didn't mention it but um we we mentioned it earlier but they were so um uh, reckless with this chainsaw earlier in the movie when that first person got killed you know the, the first one who just got knocked in the head with with the sledgehammer mm-hmm. um Gunnar Hansen was telling him what you know, while they're filming it, he's like, do not move your head. Like he couldn't see outside of the mask. So he's like, I'm going to be moving the chainsaw here. Do not move your head. Do not flinch. If you don't move your head and if you don't flinch, you'll be good. If you flinch, I'm going to hurt you. Uh, oh. and because it was a real chainsaw that they were using. So that actor had to sit there with the chainsaw three inches away from him. So, three inches away from his head so i just thought that was crazy and then now to see it at the end of this movie we're seeing this real chainsaw going at this metal door it's like these guys are reckless here but i mm-hmm. didn't but mm-hmm. to go back to your point i don't understand why they didn't just leave they did like a comedy thing where they go in one door yes and out the other it's like make it make sense you know yeah and honestly here's the thing that kind of threw me off is like i love the truck driver i love that there's a black person in this movie I love that he has Black Maria on his shirt. But the fact that this guy had a monkey wrench and threw it exactly where it needed to go so Leatherface can cut his leg yeah. and not make him as functional. <clears throat> Listen, you had you had my disbelief for the longest time. But you mean to tell me this guy's over here throwing fucking pinpoint shots? I'm sorry. I just, you lost me a little. He was, hey man, all I know is darts were very popular in the 70s. <laughs> this man looked like he liked to drink a lot. He had the beer belly. I think he definitely had some, <laughs> hey man, I'm making excuses because I love this movie, but it's, it's. I was gonna say, but where, where did he run off to? Yeah. That's my question. Yes. W- w- yes. Let's talk about that. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so he, um, have you played Dead by Daylight? The, the game Dead by yes. Daylight? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. First of all, if you ever want to play with Dead by Daylight, let's fucking play Dead by Daylight. I would love to play Dead by Daylight. I'm bad at it, so I like don't play much. I literally don't care. I literally don't care. But but this seems like Dead by Daylight to me because they're just going around this this truck, you know? And it's so, it's yes, so fun. Yes. But um Le- <coughs> Leatherface is chasing them and I love how the black dude, if I'm remembering correctly, is it Black Maria? He, let's call him Black Maria. He's uh, <laughs> he's running ahead of Sally, right? Yeah, he's yes, yeah, he's running, he's like, yeah. You, blonde chick. I'm hey, not saving you. this guy's. This guy's fat as fuck. Yeah, and that's why I love him so much because, like, hey, we can do that. <laughs> and he's like, he's he's not he's not trying to be the black savior, which I love. Mm-mm. He's like, he stopped only because he hit something, right? And he had to stop. Uh, and then so. He's running, and she, he looks behind him, and just as he was getting out of the car, he grabbed that monkey wrench, like you're saying, and threw it, and made contact directly in Leatherface, and Leatherface falls down, and uh, the chainsaw falls on his leg, and um, that was the only connection that we see in this movie of chainsaw to flesh, 
That's the only <laughs> one we see. And actually, no, that's the second one. Well, the second Franklin. one that dies. What we, we Franklin does die by it, but we don't see actually uh, the the chainsaw make a connection to this flesh. Do we? I may be incorrect. Well, to his chest, I thought. Okay, possibly then. But mm-hmm. but uh, at we see uh, so Gunnar Hansen <clears throat> had a, a a metal plate on his leg, and then they put like some raw meat in there in between the plate and hit his pants. And then so he literally put the chainsaw to his leg. And at one point he thought that it he had actually gotten cut because he felt the heat, but it was just the heat from the blades going through. Oh. These motherfuckers were f- hardcore, man. Hey, 50 years ago, I'm glad I'm not there. I'm so glad I'm not there. <laughs> they're like they're like die for the art, you know? It's fucking mm-hmm. crazy. But it, it all comes through in the movie, at least for me. So the truck driver escapes. He runs off his own way. And a pickup truck shows up and they see that Sally is clearly going through it. And so it stops. And this is when Sally knows, okay, great. This is my opportunity to get into the trunk of the of the truck. Uh-huh. And <clears throat> what happens is something that I quite don't understand is like Leatherface doesn't quite get to her. And yeah, <laughs> so Sally gets to make her escape. But one of my really, really, really favorite things is as Sally abandons the scene by jumping into the truck, Leatherface is still giving chase. Now, as the pickup driver is pulling away, Sally screams and like she's been screaming for the last half hour. But Sally is screaming, keep going, keep going, keep going. And this is 100 percent understandable. Now, one of the things that I really love and appreciate and one of the things that really makes sense to me is Sally screams to keep going, start turning into laughter. It's the kind of laughter where you really understand you're no longer in the dangerous situation that you thought you were in. Not only is she incredibly happy that she is escaping the situation she was in, she's also laughing at the fact that she's gone through such a traumatic event and it's now over. Uh, Granted, the healing is not over. She still needs to go through therapy and what have you. But one of the things that I just really found so interesting is that the screams go from terror to laughter. And this to me means that this person understands that the horror that they just experienced is over and that they just went, they just went through some crazy ass shit. And now what we watch, what we see from them going forward is totally as a result of the trauma that we just saw them go through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like she's absolutely crazed out of her mind when she jumps mm-hmm. into the back of this pickup. And again, th- this was another one of those scenes where Gunner was like catching up to her. And so he had to stop himself. Right. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. she was so slow. And if you see like her, tr- she like fails trying to get into the back of the pickup. Yeah. <laughs> And spectacularly so, fails yeah and so like gunner is just there with like and i guess that's one of the good things is that his we we can uh attribute it to him being injured but he does like have to slow down to not catch up to her right and then once she's in the van or once she's in the back of the, the pickup truck i should say yeah she's absolutely crazed out of her mind like go 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 and her eyes i mean absolutely iconic mm-hmm. shot she's absolutely covered mm-hmm. in blood from the uh, from the, the hitchhiker's blood that got splatted on her and yeah, it, it's iconic. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. I love it. Uh, and then uh, two things. One, why did that pickup guy, why did the pickup truck, he made like this crazy ass turn to, to pick her up. Okay, maybe you lost yeah. control. But then he doesn't pick up the black dude. The black the black Mar- black Maria kept running. Mm-hmm. So I know you mm-hmm. say that he escaped and I really, really hope that he did. But who honestly fuck, who the fuck knows who knows honestly that's all i could that's all i could say to like not um make more conversation happen because he didn't escape because leatherface was right there dancing very fine by the way with his leg all fucked up meanwhile he couldn't walk but he can dance yeah i have a question about that but meanwhile this black uh truck driver i don't think he escaped he just escaped out of scene so i'm like okay out of sight out of mind yeah yeah i'd like to think he did is uh, he did escape, but honestly, the way the movie is, well, you know, the, there's still the old man. 
the old man may have, may have gotten him, but I, I, I hope not. <laughs> but so then we do end in this iconic scene of Leatherface doing his tantrum, right? Where he's just dancing around in a circle mm-hmm. with his uh, with his chainsaw. And when Toby Hooper was telling him what he wanted to do, he, what he wanted Gunnar Hansen to do, he said, just just kind of go crazy with it. And so, so Gunnar started just going around in circles. And then he actively tr- started trying to hit the the camera operator and Toby Hooper who were just inches away from him oh. with with the thing to to make it scary and so that's what we're seeing there like it looks fucking <laughs> terrifying but but I do smile yeah but but awesome <laughs> it's it, just amazing it, absolutely amazing ending and then we just fade to black right that's one of the things about these seventies movies is I feel they that they just end so abruptly mm-hmm. it's like we're done <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> I mean, that's the story they wanted to tell. And as soon as they're done telling that story. And they're done. They're done. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So uh, in an 80s or late 80s to 90s movie, we would have then seen a scene at a hospital with Sally. She's surrounded by ambulances and she's being taken in and the cops are t- asking her questions. Mm-hmm. None of that is necessary. End the movie when it should have ended. And 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 you, you're left with perfection. So, yeah, I appreciate it a lot. I like that. Yeah, I liked it a lot. So that's the end of the movie, Anthony. That <laughs> that was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Tell me how you really feel. Now, Miguel. <laughs> now, Miguel, I have to ask you, what do you think about this movie? Uh, okay, that's fair. I absolutely love this movie. I'm I'm happy okay. that uh, this was almost like a re- uh, like a fresh movie to me because it had been so far. So so long since I'd seen it. Um, absolutely fantastic. This is the epitome of that grindhouse, that gr- that grungy, dirty, filthy, raw, independent filmmaking that I love. Um, yeah. I just made that ask. Oh my god! No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I can see it though because there's some. This is a nasty movie. It's it's really. Like Halloween, mm-hmm. Halloween is my favorite movie, uh, my favorite horror movie of all time, and this is certainly different than Halloween. Right? Halloween mm-hmm. feels cleaner; um, it feels more, mm-hmm. more refined. Where, and, and I'm not, and I, I'm not insulting Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> it's just different vibes that they went for. The, Miguel hates every fucking <laughs> movie that came out before Halloween, and this shit's fucking garbage, bro. <laughs> no. Halloween is my touchstone for everything. You you, you know that already. <laughs> five episodes in, yeah. But but, but <laughs> it, it's just a different vibe, and I love that vibe. Uh, I absolutely love it. This is what uh, Rob Zombie was trying to make Halloween into his remakes, but he lacked the ability to, and he lacked the talent like he does with most things. <laughs> and he, he couldn't do it. He tried to rot. He tried to rip that directly from this movie. And he just can't do it. And <laughs> you call, you call, Bobby, Bobby, did you hear that? Robert? Yeah. Robert? Yeah. I got a problem. With we that. all, we, we all, we all think the same thing. We talk about it when you're not here. So like, <laughs> Imagine just like, yeah, you suck. <laughs> Imagine me calling him and like, yeah, you suck. <laughs> yeah, Travis hates you too, so. <laughs> and his sister. Yeah. So like, fix that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, I love this movie. I think for me, it's it's a perfect movie in, in all aspects. <gasps> it's a five upside down cross movie. For me. Okay. That, okay. That's how I feel about it. So then I'll get into what I think about it. Yeah. So I think this movie has sort of like a legendary status. Like this movie has clearly influenced so many movies that came after it. Creepy Hitchhiker, um, Killer in an Abandoned Location. I think this movie has clearly influenced others that came after it. So in that aspect, it gets a four. But for what this movie is on its own, it's a two. Because it's not great. It's not cool. Uh, I'm so, oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so, I, wow. la- ladies, everybody, I just hurt Miguel's feelings personally. <laughs> wow. 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 I think this uh, movie had, I think this experiment has failed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to say this, this movie has its place as a classic pillar of horror. 
and that cannot be taken away. But if we're gonna look at this movie and look at it like, is it good? It's not. It's not. Okay. In in what I'm interested in what ways do you not find it good? Because to me, it's like shot beautifully. Um, there's some amazing shots, like for example, at the very beginning of the movie, when they pick up the hitchhiker, and there's that wide shot with the mm-hmm. with the car uh, with the van uh, driving in from the left to the right, and it goes away uh, goes all the way across the screen, and the hitchhiker is like running up to it. Beautiful shot. The shot with them wa- with the with the woman walking into the house. Beautiful shot. Like so, I think it's shot beautifully. The acting isn't that bad. The, the scares are great. Um, so, so I'm curious to know what is it that that, that didn't work for you? Is it just the '70s um, vibe? Is it that no. it, it could never pass that '70s vibe? No. I think this movie heard the word plot and was like, "Yeah, cool. Okay, we can do that." <laughs> uh, uh, this movie has no plot. I'm sorry. Um, Loose threads by the mile. Mm-hmm. This this movie has no concrete plot. This movie has no clear villain. Like, which is that's honestly that's one of the cool things about it is that this movie has no clear villain. Because here's the thing. Am I supposed to hate Franklin or Leatherface? What do you hate you hate it where you dislike Leatherface? You you dislike Franklin. You don't want him to die. Well. <laughs> but here's the thing, Leatherface was having was dealing with people invading their house. Franklin was a fucking asshole who I can't understand. So are you telling me you're a stand your grounder right now? You're... Don't do that. Don't do that to me. <laughs> okay. I'm, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> but but like, so are you saying that because they came into the house that he has the right to kill them? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What we're, what reason is Kirk walking into the house? There's no reason. No, what, was reason. Reason. what was the reason? What was the reason? What was the reason? I just explained, I just explained the reason. What was the reason, bitch? I don't need to explain myself to you. And what was have... the reason? Like you're knocking, you're knocking on the door. What are you running into the house? No, yeah, like they. First of all, the only reason they're there is because of Franklin. And for some reason, you think you're allowed to walk into a stranger's home because you need something? No, absolutely not. Okay, so I agree with you. I see where you're coming from now. So you're seeing them as culpable in their own deaths. They're yeah, they're intruders. Like the well, only person, the only person who did not walk into the house was Franklin and Sally. Everybody else, everybody else who died went into that house uninvited, unannounced. Who knows who the fuck you are? Why are you here? Like they're trespassing. Franklin, honestly, the person who I dislike the most, I don't understand why he was killed randomly. But everybody else, it's like, hey, you walked into a house where you weren't invited in. This is an interesting turn of events here, Anthony. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Sally was also, they attempted to murder her, and she was, she didn't go into the house. They brought her to the house. She was on her way there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. So she I, wanted to, she, she would have if she found it. So, so can I, what I think the real pro, well, what I'm, what I'm hearing in this, I may be incorrect, but what I'm hearing is that you didn't like the characters very much. Oh, there, was there a likable one? Yeah. Okay. So then that, that makes sense now. So because you didn't connect to the characters, you didn't really connect to the movie so much. There was a very thin plot. I'm, I'm I completely agree with you there. Okay, so then that, that that's understandable. So you're saying uh, to are you averaging these out at all? No, no. <laughs> Death to all of them. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, I mean uh, I'm average. Uh, I meant like averaging out like the rating. So like you said, you gave it a four for a movie and two. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. So I can ultimately. This movie gets a three because this movie has laid the path for so many movies after it. Literally. Creepy hitchhiker, creepy house, creepy residents of a house. This movie has laid the groundwork for so many movies that we like probably enjoy today. And this movie deserves its credit. Was this movie good on its own? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, 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 no. But does this movie has its place in does this movie have its place in history? I believe so. 
I want to apologize to you because I failed you. I we're halfway through this <laughs> and I feel like I've done major damage. We we were going in the right place and now we have drastically went backwards and that's my fault and I'm sorry to you. Hey. This. Hey, you're not the 70s, okay? <laughs> I feel like I am. I feel like I'm a representative of the 70s right now. And I'm not, you know, I thought, yo, I thought with this movie, we were going to make it over the edge. Like we were going to, it was all smooth sailing. And you, Anthony, I got to I gotta give it to you, bro. You, you threw me for a loop on this one. Okay. Would I make it easy for you? Would I? <laughs> yeah. So Come on. So then. I gave it a five. Upside down. <gasps> you gave it a three upside down. No, a hey, for real. A five. Anthony, would I fuck with you Miguel. right now, Anthony? This is a perfect movie. <sighs> Literally, when I say perfect, there is not one thing I can find wrong with this movie. Yeah, she heard me. <laughs> 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 I, I just love it. It's my vibe. I love grindhouse movies. I love, I mean, I, I love all aspects of the seventies, right? And you know, independent cinema, all, all that sort of stuff. It's just my vibe, so I, it's perfect for me. Honestly, so you were saying, um, but you're saying there's some like loose threads that were left out. What, what were some of them? Because I'm, I'm honestly interested. Were there uh, the, and, and it, there were none that I can think of. Damn! Unfortunately, I don't remember anymore. Point for Miguel. Okay, moving on. (laughs) (laughs) You win. No, no, no. You're right. (laughs) Honestly, like you, I love your your opinion is who you are, right? And I, I love that (laughs) that we're here. We're talking about this. We're having a good time about it, and we're not getting angry. A lot of people on the internet will just be fucking, fucking angry. Because I hear. Because here's the thing. What does it matter? Like, the 70s was 50 years ago. <laughs> what does it matter what we think about it now? Yeah. Like, nothing. <laughs> it happened. It is what it is. <laughs> we can have our thoughts about it all willy-nilly. So, I guess what I would say now is then that we have. To, I have to pick the next movie very, very carefully. Yes. Okay, yeah, because it's absolutely your choice. And there's, like, four different versions. There's four different movies you can pick. Yeah. And so, we have... Jaws, which came out in 75. Mm -hmm. Trilogy of Terror, which I'm going to say no to that automatically because I got to come out guns blazing because after this, whatever the fuck just happened right here, I need to, I need to do a 180 and I need to get you back on my side here because, because I felt like we gained a lot of momentum with Black (laughs) Dark and (laughs) Torso. Literally, I said last week I saw a corner and I think I turned it. And this week I'm like, mm, might have been talking too loud. <laughs> okay, all right. And I feel like um, like two steps forward, one step back. You know what happens? You know, Paula Abdul wrote a whole song about it. So, so, so next week we have either Jaws, the Stepford Wives, the, the Stepford Wives, or Satanico Pandemonium, which. I I think we're gonna I yeah here's yeah the, yeah yeah here's the thing Anthony I need a surefire winner and Jaws is a surefire winner whereas Satanical Pandemonium is the more high risk high reward right it's risky I don't like the I don't like the ocean okay I think you're giving me some hints some vibes here trying to help me out okay I think Satanical uh, I love um, from Death Till Dawn yeah. Okay. I love Selma Hayek. Okay. I love Santanico Pandemonium. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, I, I got to take some time. I have to regroup after this. I was just attacked. And so I need to regroup. <laughs> I need to recenter myself. But yeah, we're going to we're gonna be talking another movie next week. Uh, join us for 1975. Uh, our next episode for uh, My 70s Confessional here. Wanted to thank you guys all for listening again. I want to thank you, Anthony, for doing this uh, once again. <laughs> I had a, I can't describe to you how fucking fun this is doing this every week, and so thank you very much. Thank you. The fuck. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
How dare you? <laughs> so uh, once again, if you could let everybody know where they could follow you. I'm most active on Twitter, Anthony Jerome M. Anthony, J-E-R-O-M-M at twitter.com. Listen, that's just where I try to have fun. If you're not trying to have fun, don't follow me. But yeah. Okay. Miguel, yourself? Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to follow me, you, you can follow the show on Twitter at MHCPod, like My Whore Confessional Pod. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at My Whore Confessional. If you'd like to email the show, you can email me at MyHoreConfessional at gmail.com. The art was done by Brian Demarest. You can find our, our really good friend, Brian Demarest. He's an absolutely amazing artist. Go follow him. He is a Evil Flynn with two ends on Twitter. I'll link him in the bio notes and all that sort of stuff. So you can follow him as well. Give him all the money. Cause he's extremely talented. The mm-hmm. music, the, the music was done by Taylor Fox. She did the music for season one and she just did it for season two as well. If you'd like to follow her, you can follow her on Instagram at the Taylor Fox, uh, her band. You can follow that as well. That's great head and look out for their, their uh, first album dropping sometime in this century. So, <laughs> thank you everybody for listening we'll talk to you next week Mwah.